Alhamdulillah wa salatu salam ala rasulillah. Uh, Bobby, pleasure being here. Pleasure meeting you. Uh, I've seen some of your videos and, and uh, I think you are somebody who is sincerely looking for the truth. Uh, I think, I mean, this is my perspective. I mean, we've got Bobby's perspective. We'll take after the Bob's perspective. But, um, you know, I see a lot of people on YouTube that have kind of preconceived ideas and or, or they're just kind of doing things for clicks and views. And I don't see you like that. I think you've been through a Christian background. You know a lot about the church. You know about the Trinity. And I think kind of on your own, you've realized that that's not the truth. That that's just, it doesn't really fit, you know. And and I myself, uh, as I don't know if you know much about my background, but I grew up going to churches. I mean, I didn't grow up going to the masjid. I grew up going to Bible studies. And uh, there's a place called Horizon uh, Christian Church here. We used to have this Bible study group. And um, you know, myself growing up, I had no Muslim friends. I wasn't around the Muslim community. All my friends were either Christian or Catholic. Um, and and kind of like you, you know, like like I really wanted to believe it for a while. Like I really wanted to understand it, even though like my family is Muslim, but I, I didn't go to a masjid growing up. I grew, I went to only churches, but it didn't make sense. Like it didn't really fit together. And And when I started to study Islam, when I went on kind of a spiritual journey, you could say, um, it really made sense. I mean, everything fell together. Uh, some you know, misconceptions had to be cleared up, but other than that, I mean, it really did. And it resonated with what I really saw as the message of the earlier prophets as well. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And uh, I think, alhamdulillah, uh, you have already come through a lot of that journey. And inshallah, by the will of Allah, we're going to answer your questions today. Anything you have, and then you're becoming Muslim, inshallah, inshallah. God willing. So thank you very God much, willing. first and foremost, for having me. It's a great honor to be here. A little bit about my background as well for people that don't know. Yes, it's correct. I come from a Christian background, however, from an Orthodox Christian background. My parents are from the Balkan, from this little country called Northern Macedonia. It used to be Bulgaria, it used to be Greece, constant shifting, moving. Then it was under the Ottoman Empire. In the Ottoman Empire, the caliphate, so to speak, left a very negative perception on the Balkan mm -hmm. with the Christian Slavs. So therefore, I grew up with a lot of hate for Islam. I've been sure. told that Islam is the enemy. I've been told that Islam is only for the Turks or the Albanians, because those were the only ethnic groups that were Muslim around us. And I've been told that they wanted to destroy us as people, our religion, our culture, everything, right? And then I grew up in Germany, surrounded by Turks, yet again, being Muslim, <laughs> right? And I saw them being, unfortunately, involved in a lot of criminality, violence, sure. even prostitution, drugs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that gave me even a worse perception of Islam, right? And it confirmed at the same time that Islam is wrong. Many, many times mm. I would see certain bodies of mine that were Muslim, they would end up in jail. And I would mm. say, yeah, that must be due to the religion, man. You know, they just didn't get the memo. <laughs> right. that's, that's probably why, right? But when I actually started looking into my own religion, and this is after a long, long journey of exploring everything else, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Taoism, psychedelics, shamanism, and whatnot, traveling the world. I even been to South America, to the shamans, to the Native mm -hmm. Americans, to see what they are doing, what they are brewing. And ultimately, I came to the conclusion that all of this doesn't fulfill me. So mm -hmm. I started looking naturally into my Christian roots. Right. And to cut the long story short, ultimately, I came to the conclusion that you just have two options. It's basically nihilism or God. That's basically mm. it. So aside from religion, that's all you got. Right. Mm. You will always end up either worshiping yourself, worshiping desires, worshiping pleasures, worldly things, or you're going to decide for God. I found that at first at Christian orthodoxy, but I was the first one within my family <laughs> cousins, uncles, my father, mother, they didn't know much about the theology to actually mm. look into Christian orthodoxy and find out about the Trinity. Mm. And that's no joke. I want to clarify that again for many Muslim viewers. Most Christian orthodox that I personally know, they have no idea about the Trinity. They might have heard surely about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but in that combination, nobody ever thought about God being three in one. They think mm. 
as God is God. God is yeah. one God. I was the first one to actually research that, and I really got shocked because I was expecting this to be some sort of Catholic theology, maybe Protestant mm. theology, but not an Orthodox theology. Now, looking back, of course, kind of naive of mine, I started researching into the Council of Nicaea, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, then I Excellent. found out, sure, now it all makes sense. Of yeah. course, it is an Orthodox doctrine, so to speak, an Orthodox mm. Christian doctrine. However, it didn't resonate with me at all. Zero, mm. right? And I started having talks even with my father. And I told him about the Trinity, and he looked at me and said, oh, that's really what they believe in. That is crazy. I said, I said, who, is they? who is they? Yeah. He said, yeah, the, the Muslims, right? I'm like, no, 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 it's not the Muslims. They don't believe in the Trinity. They believe in one God. We believe in the Trinity. So like, what? That doesn't make any sense. I'm like, yeah, I know. Yeah, so that's basically it. So I started researching further, and ultimately I became a dad one and a half year ago almost now. Thank God for that. And... I just felt that my journey hasn't finished. Mm. I didn't feel content within my own faith any longer. Mm. Having all of those questions about my own faith didn't make sense. It can't give you peace anymore if you're consistently just looking within your own ideology and it doesn't add up. So I said to myself, you know what? I have to debunk Islam first, basically, <laughs> so I can become even more content within my own faith right gotcha. if i discard the enemy then my faith will finally make sense again yeah and then i started reading the quran for the first time and mm. the rest is history basically now we're here right no 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 so tell me more this is beautiful so when you read the quran how did it affect you yeah at first i said that in my previous videos what affected me is that the quran almost on every surah starts worshiping god right mm. gives praise to god and for me that was mind-blowing and I know that to many Muslims, this is just common sense. But for me personally, this was absolutely mind-blowing because the Bible itself, there are different books piled together, right. stories, etc. It's interesting to read. But nevertheless, the Quran starts in a very, very specific fashion of mm. worshipping God. And that on its own already discarded my preconceived notion of looking for the devil within the Quran, <laughs> right? Because I was really looking for the devil. And then right. it started praising God. So I said, okay, man. So if you're praising God on almost every you know, page here, yeah, every how will this time, become the devil? Every time we begin the recitation of the Quran, we begin with the billahi minash shaitan al rajim. We seek refuge with Allah from the cursed and discredited devil. So this is always something interesting because in other religious traditions, and again, like uh, like yourself, I have gone through Hinduism, Buddhism. Uh, Jainism in that form and uh, you know uh, every every type of Christianity that I could get my hands on I do have an orthodox bible as well I recently got one um, I've been to an orthodox church before Greek orthodox um, right. and obviously I've been to a lot of catholic churches protestant churches I've been to kingdom halls uh, mormon temples and all of that uh, I, I never saw a religious tradition that every time they began a recitation of their text that would seek refuge away from cursing the devil and, and with Allah, with the one creator. And myself, in the same way, when, when I read the Quran, uh, having come from a background of, of studying the Bible more, which was, again, it was very much the accounts of people. I mean, even if you look at the Old Testament, you will find a lot about different kings. And um, it, it really seemed more like people giving their accounts than God speaking to you. Uh, the New Testament, again, uh, if you look at the Gospels, very little is actually God speaking, you know. Even Jesus, yes. peace and blessings be upon him. Um, I have a Bible that, that it, it highlights everything that they say as, as the words of Jesus compared to everybody else. It's very few words in comparison to the rest of the Bible. And obviously, Paul, and you know, you know about the Pauline doctrine and his, and the fact that he was condemned by some of the original followers of Jesus for leaving the, the 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 old testament laws and so on and so on um you know so so to me when i read the quran uh the first time in a, in a focused way not as you know a little child or something it was amazing because it was really as if god is speaking to me directly and i would get that feeling in every chapter that it would kind of affect me on how i should live my day-to-day -day life so i think that's wonderful now um a little bit just for the benefit of the viewers, because you have a very good background and you know a lot. Um, 
what I can tell you from my own self, and none of these are loaded questions. This is all just a friendly conversation, right? Absolutely. What was very difficult for me with the Trinity was uh, two things that, that personally just didn't make sense to me as a person. One was that Jesus being co-equal to God. Right? Because every time I read the Bible, it didn't read like that. When I read the Bible, Jesus was always praying to God. Um, Jesus was always asking help of God. Jesus was even sometimes complaining to God and you know, asking for this cup to be taken away from me or why have you forsaken me and fulfilling those prophecies, uh, putting his head on the ground, praying to God. Jesus not knowing whether there's uh, leaves on a, or, or fruit on a, on a fig tree or not knowing about the hour clearly demonstrated a hierarchy to me, right? And many clear verses, like even in John, where it says uh, that you may get to know eternal life and the one true God. And then to separate from that, and Jesus Christ, who you have sent, clearly, even the people in the Bible, when they recognize Jesus, they said, this is the prophet of Galilee, you know? of uh, So uh, to me, when when I, when the preacher would tell me that they're co-equal, co-existent, Jesus has always been God, and then tells me, you know, Jesus was praying to God, then I would say, okay, well, then he must not have been God at that time, right? I mean, that doctrine must be that when he came to earth, he was no longer God. And they're like, no, no, he was fully God. What? That didn't make sense to me at all, you know? What about you? Like, what, what, was, the, what was the most, uh, you know, conflicting yeah. thing that... Yeah, we basically have the same hang up there on the Trinity. Predominantly, what I found later on researching, especially Orthodox Christianity, was that they have a wording for everything, right? So, mm. for example, okay, how about that Jesus didn't know about the fruit on the fig tree, as you said? Right. Yeah, well, then he was fully human, okay, but he was fully God as well. And if you ask about something else, a little side tangent here, how about all the icons within the Orthodox Church, right? Right. We, we worship them. We don't worship them. We venerate them, right? Mm. So I always see this wording, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Which ultimately I found very disingenuous because we mm. use different words for the exactly same issue here. Right. Venerating, worshipping, we all know what's... Right. There is there's right. no real difference here. And so when it comes down to the Trinity, the core equality was the biggest hurdle here, of course, because yeah. if we are speaking about the God-man, mm -hmm. he is fully God, which for me was a hiccup already at the beginning because I was thinking right. that the all-transcendent God cannot be contained, even if we would believe in some sort of... of Buddhist, Hindu perception of that somebody can actually receive the wisdoms of the universe within oneself. Sure. You can never receive all of them in one right. mere little human being. It's absolutely impossible to contain all of that knowledge. So therefore, the full God-man that then is lacking knowledge is not the God-man any longer, even if we accept right. that premise. So that does make sense to me. And that makes that says perfectly uh, put. I mean, you know, I think of it like this: you can't have a square circle. You know, right. it, it, it's not that you know some people are like, oh, you mean God can't do it? No, no, it's not that. It's by definition they can't be the same. A circle has no sides, and right. a square has sides, <laughs> so you can't yes. have a square circle. I mean, God can make a circle, God can make a square, He can do whatever He wants, but by definition, those two cannot be the same. So God is all-knowing, as we find in the Old Testament, as we find uh, in the Quran, as we find in the New Testament, that God knows everything. So, okay, yes. so that's that's the definition. And I think everybody in their nature, what we in Islam call fitrah, the natural belief, they would agree that God knows everything. He's all-powerful. Makes sense. But then you cannot not know the hour and be God. And right. Christians will do all kinds of like, uh, and this is not something new. Like, they will do all kinds of backflips and give different explanations. But to me, in my heart, it just it just didn't fit, you know. So, alhamdulillah, when I read about Allah being the all-knowing, there's nothing that is not known to Allah. There's nothing that is new to Allah. Uh, Allah being all-capable. Allah being so great. The Quran tells us there is no example that we can give to give similitude to it. To 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 Allah in this earth, that was beautiful. Like it made sense. A one creator that created everything, and look at the DNA of everything has things in common. 
I mean, even bananas, humans have things in common in their DNA. Not, not that I'm saying we came from bananas, but <laughs> but it does show that there is one creator. You know, it, the signature is there. So it made sense. You know, if you looked at the earlier prophets, what was their message? Hear, O Israel, your Lord is one. And this is the same thing Jesus, when he was asked, what is the greatest, what is the first of all the commandments? He said, your Lord is one, right? Islam, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say who Allah is one, made sense. And you follow the prophet of your time. So the believers in the time of Abraham, they followed Abraham. The believers in the time of Moses followed Moses. The believers in the time of Jesus followed Jesus. The believers in the time of Muhammad followed Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon all of them. Makes perfect sense to me. No? What do you think? Yeah, what you said there with uh, there is nothing new to God. So that is very important as well, right? Because mm. as Christians, we assume as well that God is perfect. However, when he takes on the form of Jesus, that must be new to God as well, right? So therefore, there is something exactly. that God himself, no matter which part of the Trinity, if you believe in that, has to have a new experience, so to speak, in order to reach some sort of way of perfection, some sort of knowledge even, right? Why would sure. he have to make that experience as God if he is perfect from the beginning to the end? He has no beginning, he has no end. Where is this actually happening, right? And this will be discarded as well as a divine mystery then. <laughs> that is not sufficient <laughs> this is, explanation. Yes. This is always the, the, the term used by Christians when they can't explain something. The mystery of the Trinity, you know, yeah, yeah. and it's like, you know, again, if this is going to be a core part of our belief system, then it's got to, it, it can't be a mystery. <laughs> I mean, some right. things about God, we don't need to know. We don't need to know, uh, you know, uh, some details because that's between God and his creation, all that. But, but what is going to be our belief has to be something that even a, a illiterate farmer can fathom. Well, there is one creator. He sent the prophets. You worship none but that one creator. Easy. Makes sense. From a PhD scientist to a illiterate fisherman can understand and grasp that concept, right? So anyway, this is a beautiful conversation, but I know you have some questions. So I'm going to let you uh, hit me, put me in the hot seat. The hot seat. <laughs> All right, let's do it. So first, and this is not for me personally, necessarily, but much more for my audience as well for your audience for people that are watching. Why Islam? As a concise, Excellent. quick answer, why Islam? Why not any other religion? Why? Re you know what I mean? Why religion? Great why decide to give your life to Islam? Great question. I'm going to give a brief answer. Um, yes. Look, I know, and you know, and everybody knows in their heart of hearts that we didn't come by ourselves. We didn't create ourselves. We didn't choose to be born. We didn't make the universe. That there is a creator. When we, even uh, as humanity, sometimes when we fall into these concepts of worshipping your own desires called atheism or uh, agnosticism, well, I've been on a plane next to somebody that I've had a long conversation about God and he told, trying to convince me there's no God. And that plane starts to shake immediately, <laughs> like, oh God, oh God, oh God, turns to me, pray for, pray for us. Pray to who? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the reality is, we know there is a creator in our heart. We know it. It's, it's, we see it in, in the perfection of the human, the perfection of the universe. So, if there is a creator, I cannot believe that an uh, all knowing, all wise creator would leave us without guidance. Uh, look, Bob, if you were to create a new a machine or some new technology that nobody's ever seen and you're such an intelligent person you've made this new technology you're not just going to give it to people like here do whatever you want with it no you're going to tell people this is how it works this is what it's for any cell phone any laptop that you get is going to have a user manual that's going to tell you how to use that the manufacturer who knows the designer knows is going to tell you how to use it correctly so if there is a creator, which obviously from seeing all the signs in the universe there is, then that creator has to have given us some guidance how to live. What, what, what's the purpose of our creation? So then it comes to what religion? So this tells you why I believe there is a God, right? I have, and as you have, been through the studies of many religions. And no doubt that I find in all of them there is a, a concept that is man-made, meaning before the Council of Nicaea, if you find the Aryans, if you, and I'm not talking about the race, I'm talking about the Christian sect, and yeah. if you talk about some of the earlier uh, followers of Jesus, as many 
uh, atheists have also in their research, like Bart Ehrman and others said, that they did not consider Jesus to be God. They saw him as a prophet. And they saw him as somebody who brought a message. Until this pagan ideology of God having a son was kind of brought into Christianity. And, and, and look, let me give a very simple example for your viewers. I mean, I think you're past that, but for everybody else. Look at Christmas. Almost every Christian across the board, except for maybe Jehovah's Witnesses and stuff, celebrates Christmas. Every church decorates up Santa and gifts and reindeers. And throughout different parts of the world, uh, you know, all, I was I was in Malaysia and, and I saw Christians in Malaysia celebrating Christmas. I was in the UAE, in, in, in the Arab country, in the United Arab Emirates, and I saw Christians celebrating Christmas uh, in the United States, in the UK, everywhere. And anybody who takes five, ten minutes to research will know that Christmas has nothing to do with Jesus. Peace and blessings be upon Jesus. We love him. Christmas was a pagan Saturnalia uh, uh, festival that they brought into Christianity. They imported it in. And one of the earlier popes, and it's documented when he did it, the, many of the church fathers rebelled. Even the purists who came to America were against Christianity, against uh, the uh, concept of Christmas. Christmas. Yep. So if we look at that and how widely that has become accepted in the, in, in the churches across denominations, it tells you that these man-made ideas have been put into Christianity. Same thing with Judaism. If you look at Judaism, and I have studied it in some depth, uh, you know, if you look at most very orthodox practicing Jews today, their manner of dress has nothing to do with Moses or the Torah or, or David. It has to do with Europe. This is these yes. are things that they the the the, the hats, the big you know the, the big furry hat. I don't know if you've seen one of those. Yeah, and, and the, the suits, right? Suits. I was always wondering the why suits, the suits, right? Yeah. Why the suits? I mean, that's yeah. not native dress to where Moses was or David. Peace right. and blessings be upon both of them. We love them as well. I asked a, a rabbi in Israel. I was in uh, Al Quds, Free Palestine, uh, and there I free asked Palestine. one. Of, I mean. Uh, I asked one of the rabbis, and I asked him, you know, uh, why do you wear this? And he told me, you know, in, in Austria, there was a king that kind of uh, mocked the Jews by making them wear foxtails, a tied-up foxtail as an insult. Okay. And we kind of owned it. Like, we just took it and went with it, and the big furry hat that comes out, it looks like, you know, it's, they're <laughs> usually black today. I was like, wait a minute. What does that have to do with the Torah? What does that have to do with the Talmud? What does that have to do with uh, Moses or David or King Solomon? Peace and blessings be upon them. Nothing. So Zero. a lot of what we see, a lot of the practices of taking a live chicken and taking it over your head, and you can YouTube video this. It's not a joke. They take live chickens and things. It's not in the Torah. It's not, in, it's not the practice of Moses. So... I saw that a lot of that was man-made. A lot of the, the rules and regulations that have been brought into Judaism are not from the Torah. They're from the writings of different rabbis. And that's why you have so many different types of Judaism, from Reconstructionist to Reform to Ascetic to Old Orthodox to all kinds of Kabbalah and all that. Right. When I went to Islam, it's the only religion that I found that first had a, a actual preserved holy text. Meaning, even if you talk to a, a, a Jewish researcher, they will tell you that if you're talking about the Torah that was with Moses, we don't have that today. You know, mm -hmm. meaning after the fall of Babylon, after the the, the people of Israel were, you know, uh, they had to wander. All of that, they lost a lot of the earlier writings. One of the earliest, uh, and I have the Dead Sea Scrolls. The, uh, oh. One of the earliest that you will find. I mean, it's a copy, not the original. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, it's about 200 BC. Ah, that is very recent compared to when Moses and David and them were. So that means we have no manuscript for the original text. The Bible, as I mean, you've studied well, we have absolutely zero manuscripts from the time of Jesus. Peace and blessings be upon him. That's the true. earliest semi-complete uh, manuscript is going to be around the 4th century. And then most of the manuscripts that we have for the Bible are from 7th and 9th century. So the earliest uh, Quraic Sinaiticus and stuff is still going to not be complete, and it's going to be nowhere close. The Quran, on the other hand, you know, one thing amazing about the Quran 
is that we have the original manuscripts, meaning the original writings that were, uh, you know, carbon dated. I, I have actually a scanned copy right now, one of those early ones. There is what's called the Birmingham Quran. It's, it's about a page and a half where they have non-Muslims in the UK have carbon dated that to the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, and, and the beginning of the Khilaf of Abu Bakr. We have the Sun'a Quran, and Muslims memorize the Quran. Whatever country you go to, you can go to any mosque and call and tell them, recite Al-Fatiha. And from memory, yes. letter by letter, we have it memorized. That's why mm. we only have one Quran, 114 chapters, uh, Shia, Sunni, this sect. Nobody has a different Quran. We have one Quran. Maybe different styles of recitation, but everything will begin Al-Fatiha and end with the Nas, 30 sections, 114 chapters. Unlike, as you know, in the Greek Orthodox Bible is different from the Catholic Bible, Tobit and many of the chapters that are there you will not find in the King James Bible. The New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses has different uh, uh, verses than you do in NIV or KGV and all of that. Literal different chapters and verses, not a different style of recitation or different accent, no. So I found that this is there. And then the worships in Islam all go back to the original, meaning the way we pray five times a day, the Prophet prayed. We didn't invent new ways. And if somebody does invent, we consider it a bid'ah, innovation, we reject it. Even if some Muslims deviate, like you met Muslims that were off the religion, they were doing crimes and things. Mm. That's true. Muslims are humans. There's good and bad. But the religion is preserved. And that's something beautiful. We have two celebrations, Eid al-Adha, Eid al-Fitr, both of them proven from the Qur'an itself, from the practice of the Prophet, peace be upon him. We don't have Christmas and Easter and all these things that were innovated. So when I saw that preserved religion, true, and it, in line with the message of all the Prophets, to me, that's the only one that made sense. Yeah, that's a beautiful answer. What you said there about the Bible with the earliest manuscripts, that was one of the really, really big shockers to me personally when I found out that the New Testament was only in Greek. That's the only thing yeah. that we could find. So I said, oh, wow, that doesn't make any sense. But at the same time, it makes a lot of sense because I understood the Greek-infused flavor within the Greek yeah. Orthodox Church, right? And again, from the history on the Balkans, mm -hmm. the Greeks, they came over to Macedonia, started building their Greek Orthodox churches. Right. And it makes only sense, of course, that those manuscripts are written in Greek, definitely not written right. by the followers of Christ himself. And True. yeah, that leads to that type of religion, then this cultural type of identity. Exactly. It, it brings yes. a lot of Greek mythology and those pagan ideas into Christianity because it was left over from what they had already. And that's right. why if you look at the language of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, which is Aramaic, you will never find, unless they translate backward, uh, original text in Aramaic. Even the Greek texts that we have are written by unknown authors. I have mm -hmm. the MacArthur Study Bible, even though it's a very evangelical, Christian-minded study Bible, even then it says, you know what, Hebrews, the author is anonymous. Uh, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, these are, these are in accordance to them, not physically written by them. I have yes. a whole book just on Luke, and it shows that the, these writings were not written by the original uh, people. It, it even references uh, things that differently because there are accounts that were compiled later, and that's why we have clear contradictions as well. Unlike the Quran, the Quran is from one source, from Allah to Jibreel to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, written down by the companions, compiled the whole thing during the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And that's why you will never see Muslims disagreeing on the chapter of the Quran. Nobody will come and say, right. eh, there's no Al-Baqarah. You know, of course, we have come to a conclusion here. I have a follow-up question because you mentioned that God would send down a manual to us, right? It's a follow-up question guidance. that I just, yeah. some guidance. How about before the Quran? Excellent. What would have been the guidance? Excellent question. We as Muslims believe that Allah sent guidance from the first man, meaning Adam, the first man to be created, mm -hmm. was a prophet. He had the guidance for, with him. It was not a book, but it was a teaching that he knew that he taught his children. Right. During that time, yes, there were crimes committed and there was, you know, the, the, the murders and so on. But yeah. people didn't worship other than the one creator. In the time of Nuh, Noah, this 
concept of worshiping idols came. And it came through an interesting deceit from uh, the devil, which is that, uh, you know, he kind of told them, you know, you're going to miss the pious people. So kind of build up on their graves and then to make a statue of them. And like what we see with saints and saint worship in Catholicism mm. and the Orthodox mm -hmm. Church and so on. So uh, this is something that came in the time of Noah. So Noah was then sent as a messenger to the people. Allah mm. revealed to him. From his time onwards, Abraham was given Ibrahim, and we say peace and blessings be upon them. That's another thing I love about Islam, is we love all of the prophets. <laughs> and we love right. David, we love Moses, we love Abraham, we love Jesus, we love Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon them. You never see a Muslim disrespect Jesus or disrespect Moses, even if you may see a Christian or a Jew disrespect the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon all of them, but we, we love all of them. So Every one of them was given a, 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 a message. Some of them were given scriptures, like Moses was given the Torah, like David was given the Zabur, Jesus was given the Injil. We today don't have those scriptures, right? They were given to them at that time. They ruled by them. But today, like when we look at the Bible today, the Old Testament or the New Testament, any biblical scholar will tell you that these were written by many different authors over a large period of time kind of compiling what they could remember. Some parts of it may be from the true message. Christians definitely to a certain time would have had that true Injil with them. But around the 7th and 9th century, when we get most of the manuscripts, definitely a lot had changed. And that's why many uh, Gospels, like the Gospel of Barnabas, were at times put into the Bible and taken out. Tobit, for example, in the Catholic Bible, you will find it. You will not find it in the, in the Christian KGV Bible, right? So the prophets were all given messages. The last of those is the is the Quran, but it's not the first. Okay. There were others that were revealed before him. Right, that's a beautiful answer. It makes a lot of sense. Okay, so that is the explanation for why is Islam. Now I would really love to understand your understanding about God within Islam. I think that's the most important thing. Excellent. I know I know about Tawhid. I know about the monotheism. Nice. I have a specific question, however, coming from a Christian background, and that is in Christianity, the kingdom of heaven is within, right? Where is the kingdom of heaven in Islam? Excellent is question. There, is there, I want a little follow up here. Is there an intern, internal aspect to Islam? Where do we find God's light, for example? <clears throat> that would be my question. That's, metaphysical. That a, that's a great question. In Islam, we're very clear about some of the differences between guidance Light mm -hmm. in the sense of guidance. Uh, Allah Nur Samawati Wal Ard, there is a, a statement uh, that a, a verse in the Quran that Allah is the light of the uh, skies and earth. And we as Muslims, looking at the statements of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the companions who were there when the Quran was revealed, we know that that is the guidance that Allah gives, right? So there is in our hearts a light that is the guidance from Allah, right? There is uh, in our books, in our uh, religious tradition, a guidance from Allah. We believe in that. But we don't fuse the creator with the creation. Meaning Allah is unique. He is above us. Uh, and what do we say about Allah? We only say what Allah said about himself. So in the Quran, when Allah says that he is one, we say he is one. When Allah says that uh, yani he uh, there is a verse in the Quran, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa, that the most merciful is in reclining or established on the throne. Uh, we believe in it, as Allah said it. Right? We don't start saying, nah, this could mean or this might mean. We don't go there. Right? Mm -hmm. Allah is so great, we don't try to use our own uqul, our own logic to give a figure to. We just say, right. look, whatever Allah said about himself, we believe in it in that sense. So, mm -hmm. regarding where is the kingdom of heaven, there is a, a, a physical paradise, right? When we're talking about what's called Al-Jannah. And Al-Jannah is a place, and Allah has told us about it. And it's a place where we live forever. We will not be on the same level of existence as we are today. Even our appearances will be different. Our, mm -hmm. our lifestyle will be different because there's no death. There is no sickness. That is a place to enjoy. 
So I'll, I'll give you an example from a worldly life to kind of give an example just to understand a concept. Let's say, um, you know, I tell you, hey, let's go on a vacation to uh, the Maldives, right? Mm. Maldives is a beautiful place. Going through all kind of hardship, maybe there's customs issues, all this stuff. You know, there's that, there's that hardship. When you get there, you forget all that, right? It's all, it's all gone. Now you can relax. Now you can live up a beautiful life. You forget physically sometimes all the hardship you went through because now you're sitting on the beach, right? So this life is that test. You know, no matter how rich you are, no matter how powerful you are, no matter uh, how popular you are, how handsome you are, you're always going to have beautiful uh, woman or a handsome husband or whatever. You're always going to have tests. You're always going to have sickness. You're always going to have stress. You're going to have... Because this life is that test. Allah tells in the Quran, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا The one who created death and life to see which one of you puts forth the best of deeds. So this life is a test. But when you get to paradise, that's your destination. That's where you're going to enjoy. That's, that's, you made it, right? If you make it. If you worship other than Allah, if you worship uh, cows and monkeys and humans and saints, then, then you fail that test. But if you worship that one creator, you pass that test, then that is the reward, right? It is where we were meant to be. And that's why even in, in, in our own selves, we never think of humans ending. Like, like ourself, when we think about life, even when you think about death, you always realize in your heart that there is something after. You may not know what it is, but you realize it. And that's because we weren't meant to just finish like animals. Like you, you see, animals don't think about, uh, you know, we've studied animals. Uh, they don't think about hereafter. They don't, they don't organize religions. They don't worship, uh, you know, anything, right? Because their creation, they, I mean, their creation is to be of a certain purpose, right? And their purpose is on this worldly life, right? So they're eaten, they live, they, they're part of that cycle, and that, that's it. But humans are always asking this question, what is after life? Why? Because we were meant to live after this, this worldly life. So this is that paradise. It is not uh, something that is just in your heart. No, it's a physical place where you will live you will see Allah in, in paradise. There's a part of the belief of the Muslim that in this worldly life, we cannot see God. It's too great, right? We are limited and he's unlimited. But in that hereafter, we will see our creator. We will see Allah. And we will meet other people who have died uh, if, if they also were in paradise. And we'll meet family members and friends. And you will sit and you will enjoy an everlasting, beautiful life. So that is paradise. A part of the light of Allah in the sense of guidance is with us. But Allah is above. He is above the creation. Allah, uh, He has told us things about Himself, like that uh, Allah, uh, for example, that Allah gives us life, right? So we believe in that. But we don't believe that He's physically in us. Rather, we worship Allah, we don't worship the creation, right? Right. The reason why I'm asking is because, as I said, with my background, not only from Christianity, but even prior to that, I was very, very interested in metaphysical topics, and I still am. And so I started researching even further, not only into, let's say, mainstream Islam, but I looked into certain people like Ibn Arabi and Rumi, which came way, way yeah. later than the Prophet. I of course. think that, that would be the explanation of that. But even within the Quran, there are certain passages that I understood to explain the existence of God, the reality of God in a very mysterious and not so straightforward word, like he's just external, for example. So there mm -hmm. is this passage, everywhere you turn, there is the of face course. of Allah, right? So everywhere yes. you turn, what does that mean? Or another one, just the name of Allah, for example, Al-Haq, which is the ultimate reality. Sure, the so truth. What does, what does it, yeah, the truth, the ultimate reality. Excellent. Or surely he encompasses so, all things. There's sure. another one. So what does there that mean? is in the Quran there are ayat, there are verses that are muhkam, muhkamat, yani those that are very clear and uh, in their meaning is well known, right? Mm -hmm. um, for example, 
uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah in the Quran, he says, uh, ahad. there is none like Allah, right? right? That is very clear, explicit, that creation are not like the creator. He is the creator, he is the khaliq, we are the makhluk, we are the creation. Then there are mutashabbihat, those verses that are not explicit, they're not very clear, they have a very spiritual deep meaning to it. Mm-hmm. Some of it we explain through statements of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Some of it we explain through the statements of the companions who were there when the Quran was revealed and the Prophet explained it to them. Some of it we leave to Allah. We leave it to Allah. What does Alif Lam mean? Which is the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah or Alif Lam Ra. What do those letters mean? Allah knows. There is a meaning to it. We don't say it doesn't have a meaning, but we leave that to Allah. Because some things we cannot grasp in this world, right? Mm-hmm. Our 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 intelligence is too limited, right? So those things we leave to Allah. But our core belief is very clear. It's from the Quran. Allah is one. Allah is the creator. We are the creation. We worship the creator. We don't interfuse the creator with the creation. Now, Ibn al-Arabi or al-Hallaj or uh, some of these people that came later, Rumi and so on, uh, they they were mostly people who brought some concepts that were external to Islam and tried to fuse them in, right? Um, they were even the method of prayer, for example, Rumi and the whole dancing and troubling thing. Mm-hmm. We don't find in the tradition itself. We don't find in the right. Quran. We don't find in the Hadith. And a lot of what they would say would go against the clear text of the Quran. Mm-hmm. So for us, we believe in the Quran as it is, as Allah has revealed it. If there is something that we don't have a clear hadith about or a clear statement of the companions, and it's something that is not evident in itself, then we leave it as it is. We believe in it as it is. Okay. So if Allah is completely beyond his creation, he's nothing like his creation, which I personally okay. agree with. Good. How how about the physical body parts that are described Excellent. Physical so, body parts. Right? Great question. So yeah. Allah has sifat. Allah has characteristics. But as we mentioned in the Quran, it says clearly, Laysa shay, ahad, that there is nothing in comparison or resemblance to Allah, and there is none like Allah. So that tells you that the characteristics of Allah are not like us. Right? right. I'll give you a linguistic example to understand. Um, The example of Allah is unique to him, but I'm talking about linguistically. For example, uh, you have a foot, right? And we could say the mountain has a foot. We say the foothills or the foot Mm -hmm. of the mountain. But your foot and with toes and nails and all that and the foot of a mountain are nothing alike except that the mountain does have a foot and you have a foot, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We have, uh, we, we say the head of the mountain, right? Uh, the the top part, right? Well, we have heads. And the mountain has a head, but the mountain doesn't necessarily have eyes and a brain and an ear and so on. Right? Right. So even though we don't deny that the mountain has a head or you have a head, but we don't say they're they're similar, right? Mm-hmm. Allah tells us about Himself, about a waj, about a face, about a yad, about a hand, about a shaq, or a shin, and so on. We believe in them because Allah said it about Himself but we don't compare it to anything of the creation, right? We don't say, in Arabic, you use a kaf, ka, or a mithal, like a like. Like, we don't say Allah has a hand like a person. No, Mm -hmm. this would be kufr, this would be disbelief. We also don't say that Allah doesn't, because if Allah said about himself, he does, right? But how is it? In Arabic, we say the kaf. How? We don't know. When we see Allah in the hereafter, then we can see Allah, then we can ask Allah, then it will be evident for us. Mm -hmm. But when Allah tells us something about himself in the Quran, the preserved book, we believe in it. I'll give you an example, right? If you were to go to the Amazon, and I think you've been uh, in Central America, right? That's interesting, right? And you go to some of the remote tribes. And even in the Amazon now, it's very hard to find the really remote tribe. Mm. There is an island in India, off the coast of India as well, where technology has not gone. People are not allowed to visit. When the helicopter went by, they shot arrows at it and stuff, right? Yeah. So if you... They're throwing coconuts, right? The coconuts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They actually were shooting arrows. Yeah, it was interesting. Wow. Um, but think about that. If you went to those people and you had to explain to them 
how does the internet work? Mm -hmm. yeah. That'd be a difficult thing because they don't have anything like it. So what would you do? You would give an example. You would say, you see how they have, you have these vines going across the trees. And if you make a murmur on this side, you can kind of feel it on that side. It's kind of mm -hmm. like that, right? Now, that is nothing compared to a TCP, uh, TCP IP package that has a header and goes through the, you know, the fiber optics and all yes. that kind of stuff, how the internet works, right? But it, it does have a similitude. So some characteristics of Allah are so great that Allah knows everything. Like that's a very hard concept for humans. Allah sees everything. Allah hears everything. So sometimes when Allah sees it and you know it's in the Quran, then khalas, we believe in it. How exactly we can ask Allah on the Day of Judgment. But the things that have to do with your core belief, what do you have to believe? There is one creator. I think it's very simple. Everybody gets it. That creator sent messengers. We believe in those messengers. They brought a good message. They told people, don't worship idols, don't worship things. Perfect. Now, if we start getting into, well, uh, does that creator have regrets? Well, no, because he knows everything. It's in the Quran. In the Bible, we see some, some things that are strange, but very easy, right? Well, uh, if that creator knew everything, why did he create the creation? It's a test. That's what he tells us. This life is a test. That's it, right? So we believe in it. We don't get start then getting into, okay, what exactly does the creation look like? What color is he? Ah, this, is, this is foolishness. This is trying to put human ideas, right? Whatever that yeah. creator told about himself, we believe in it as it is. Yes, no, that's a very satisfying answer because Excellent. for me personally, the concept which is already transcending the concept itself that God is all transcendent and therefore nothing like his creation resonates with me deeply. And Excellent. then to literally talk about a hand wouldn't make sense. But the way that you right. explained it, it makes sense to me. Absolutely. Can you just expand on the name? Al -Haq. Al -Haq. I find that that's beautiful. A yes. Beautiful. Uh, it is a beautiful name. Al Haq. Um is the truth or the ultimate truth and we find it in the quran um just on you know i taught the different names of allah in one of the series i did we went through mm -hmm. all of them that are in the quran sahih hadith um you know i found about 10 verses in the quran just on my own that i found this reference in and here when we look in the quran we find that it says ذَلِكَ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْحَقِّ that there verily uh, it is Allah who is Al-Haq, that he is the truth, إنه يحي الموتى, that he is the one that gives life to the death and so on. And you also mm -hmm. find ذلك بأن الله هو الحق وأنما, that verily that Allah is the one that is the Haq and everything يدعونا, that that is called upon other than Allah, من دونه, other than Allah فهو الباطل, that is falsehood. So what does it tell you? That Allah is the ultimate truth, and anything yes. that is worshipped that is other than Allah is falsehood. And all truth come from Allah. The core truth of the universe is that there is a creator, Allah. Everything past that is judged in accordance to that truth. Right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, me and you can look at stars in the night, and today scientists tell us that those stars aren't even there. Right. For that light to reach us, it took so long that we see a star, but it doesn't exist. Sure. So that means things that we see could be false. Things that we hear, sometimes you hear somebody's voice, you look around, and they're not there, right? Something you hear could be false. Sometimes you touch could be false. You know, they have these 3D printing reality thingies now, right? Yeah. You, 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 right? But Allah is the only ultimate truth. And then right. whatever Allah tells us, then that is the truth. So for example, where do we come from, right? What's the truth, right? So somebody will say we came from primates. Somebody will say, no, you know, we came from a fish and the fish became a primate. And this, these are all people guessing at it, mm. you know? And, and I can tell you from somebody who works in the scientific industry, somebody who's, uh, I, my, my education is not just a religious uh, education. You know, a lot of what we believe uh, uh, today about the development of species is not what Darwin said. Uh, mm. A lot of the writings of Darwin actually were very racist and very sexist and so on. Nobody wants to talk yes. about that today, right? Yes. So It leads to the pinnacle of evolution, the British basically, right? Exactly, right? Exactly. Very and much. and what, what he wrote about some other races and some other mm. people and the difference between men and women, 
They're you wouldn't want to mention today you'll get canceled your youtube will get canceled from that right <laughs> uh, but but that's the funny thing is people have taken when we were young they taught us this 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 thing where, where there was a, a chimpanzee looking thing and then he became like a ape and then became a human they had this graph you can still google and find it mm, and then you see it. this guy walking or the briefcase Sorry, right mm. and then they're like no 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 that middle stage of the neanderthal that that, that wasn't a part of the stage that was a separate so wait, 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 wait. What you taught us as science is no longer the truth. So that tells you that these are guesswork. So how do we know what is the truth from al-haq? Allah is right. the ultimate truth, and we know what is true from what Allah has told us. That totally resonates with me. I see it in the way that if you have a temporary being like us, at least in this existence, so therefore this cannot be absolutely true if you have a God that is eternal, right? So therefore only the eternity in comparison to temporarily states can be eternally true. And therefore the wording al-haq makes so much sense to me. Excellent. That's beautiful, man. Yes. That's it, man. You're, you're ready for that Islam, man. I can feel it. No, wait, wait. We have some questions left here. So okay, let's, no get, let's, get, let's get into the Quran and the laws. Excellent. That's how Perfect. I title it. How do you see this verse of the Quran? Those who believe in the Quran and those who follow the Jewish scriptures and the Christians and the Sabaeans, only any who believe in Allah and the last day and work righteousness shall have their reward with their Lord. On them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. What does that mean for Jews, for Christians? If they say, I believe in one God, I believe in our scriptures, I'm living a righteous life. What happens to those people? That's a great question. Um, as uh, myself, I like to give actual references, not just give answers kind of on the top of my head. Um, you know, th this library is not uh, a green screen. These are actual books that I actually CGI. read. It's not CGI. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. You know, one thing I loved about Islam is it wasn't just hollow answers. Like sometimes I would ask my pastors and preachers and, and they would kind of just make up an answer. Like you were saying, they would just make up terms to give a different name to the same thing. And you're like, what? You know? Um, but in Islam, we always go back to the original text. So the Quran and this verse is in Surah Al-Baqarah. This is a tafsir. This is an explanation that mm -hmm. is based only on evidences. So not, a, a scholar's opinion like Ibn Kathir or Sa'adi, those are later scholars. This mm -hmm. is a, a, a work that has been done to compile actual narrations, meaning from the Prophet, peace be upon him himself, or the companions that were around the Prophet that learned the Quran from them. So, regarding this uh, ayah, in the Ladina Just Amanu, one second, who comes okay. this tafsir from? Who wrote this? So, Just so for my this clarification. Is, Excellent. So this is not a, a work by a particular scholar. A, mm -hmm. a entire team of scholars, they came together. It's called Mosua Tafsir Mathur, which does it okay. mean that it, they have collected a, all of the earlier books of Tafsir, like a tabari which we have, you can't see it in the, it's kind of higher mm -hmm. up here, a tabari and Ibn Kathir and all of them, when they have actual narration, like not a scholar's opinion, but mm -hmm. when the Prophet, peace be upon him, explained the verse himself in a hadith, or the companions like Ibn Abbas or Ibn Mas'ud or Salman al-Farasi, they explained a verse themselves, then they collected all of them, checked the authenticity. And this is what I love about Islam, is checking yeah. the chains of, of narrations. Um, you know, So when they did that, they compiled it into one set, which is 24 volumes. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is just one volume from it. And this is on, uh, this is the third volume, or uh, Thani, sorry, second volume. And this is uh, regarding Surah Al-Baqarah. And this is the 62nd verse about those who believe and are in guidance from the Nasara, from the Christians, and mm -hmm. the Sabians, right? Man amanu billahi, they believe in Allah on Yawm Al-Akhir, the Day of Judgment, wa amilu saliha, and they do good, good deeds. Falahum, uh, for, for, for them, ajruhum, they have their reward in the Rabbihim with their Lord. La khawfun, there is no fear alayhim upon them. Walahum yahzunun, and they will not be uh, people of regret or misery or, or sorrow, right? Right. So then, and again, this is just a rough translation I'm giving. I don't have English in front of me. Uh, regarding this verse, 
there are clear statements from, for example, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Abbas was a very close companion of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. It's his cousin, Abbas is his uncle, and he was very young when he became a Muslim, and he memorized the entire Qur'an and went over the meanings of the entire Qur'an, and he explained that this is about the Christians and Jews that were there before the time of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Okay. Because, and he explains, because later in the, in the same uh, Qur'an, Allah says that those from the Christians and Jews who hear this message and don't believe, then they will be from those who are losers. So they will be in punishment. So, it, no, so this is referring to those before. This is also a statement from Mujahid, that, and he's one of the early Tabi'un, scholars of Islam, that he asked Salman al-Farisi, Salman al-Farisi, Salman the Persian, he was an mm-hmm. actual companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So Mujahid, the great Tabi'i scholar, he said, I asked about this particular verse, and that's why I have the book with me, to show the reference. And he, Salman al-Farisi says, مَنْ مَاتْ عَلَى دِينِ عِيسَى قَبْلَ الْأَنْ يَسْمَعَ بِهِ فَهُوَ عَلَى الْخَيْرِ That this is for those that died, for example, Christians, that were following Jesus, peace be upon him, before they heard about Islam, and they were following the true message of Jesus. They were not worshipping Jesus, they were yes. actually the true followers. Huh? مَنْ سَمَعَ And whoever heard بِهِ of this religion, وَلَمْ يُؤْمِنُ بِهِ فَقَدْ حَلَكَ Whoever hears of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and does not believe in him, he is destroyed. So this verse is regarding those Christians and Sabians and Jews, whoever else, that in that early time were truly following their Prophet. That not about somebody today who worships Jesus or worships uh, any a golden calf or something else and then says, I believe in God. And this is mm-hmm. unfortunately true. I mean, amongst the Jews, we saw people that, you know, historically they worshipped a yes. golden calf and they still said they believed in God. So right. in Islam, you cannot just profess a belief and then do acts of kufr. Meaning, even as a Muslim, even as a Muslim, if you say, I believe in Allah, I believe in Islam, but then you go and worship a saint, or you mm-hmm. go and say, uh, I believe in Allah, but I don't believe in the Quran, for example. Or I believe in the Quran, but I don't believe in the Prophet. Peace and blessings be upon him. Then mm-hmm. it's kufr, it's destruction. We as people, look, you and me, we realize there is a creator. And like you've been saying, we realize that creator has sent us a message that resonates with us, that, that makes sense. It's a very core belief that was very, it's simple. Once we have that, then it is upon us to know what our creator wants from us and do that, right? To the best of, and again, all yeah. of us have shortcomings, right? I have sins, I have shortcomings. If there's no human on the face of the earth today that can say, I have no sin. If they are, they're lying, and that's a sin in itself, right? Yeah. So we all have shortcomings, but we need to say, okay, if I believe in Allah, then whatever Allah said in the Quran, whatever is proven from the Prophet, والسلام, this is going to be my way. I'm going to do my best to follow it, even with my shortcomings, and I ask Allah for forgiveness, and Allah is the most merciful. Fair enough. Right. So speaking about the Quran and seeing the Quran as the word of God. So everything that the Quran states comes straight from God. That is the claim. The question is here for me personally, when the Quran speaks about Jesus, this is very interesting for Christians, I believe. Sure. Why doesn't the Quran call him Jeshua or Yeshua or however Excellent. that would have been pronounced back then, but rather calls him Isa, Isa. if it is the word of God? Sure. So Allah says in the Quran, Verily, we revealed the Quran in Arabic, right? It is a uh, Quran revealed in Arabic. So even though many of those words will go back to a root that will be with the Aramaic terms, like Yeshua and things that we find today are still changed from their original text, right? So mm-hmm. the original reference to Isa ibn Maryam is going to be of that, right? But there's going to be an Arabized tint to it because the Qur'an is in Arabic. But the word okay. Dawood, for example, or Suleiman, these are not originally Arabic names. But when Allah says in the Qur'an that Musa salam said, Khudha, like, grab, or when Allah said to Musa salam, grab that and don't be afraid, right? Of course, this is being revealed in Arabic. Whatever language was spoken to in Musa was, in, was, a, was spoken to him in Musa. 
But the Quran is revealed in Arabic, and in Arabic, in the Quran, the name is Isa. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I remember the passage when the Quran says it was revealed to you in clear Arabic. I'm exactly. paraphrasing here. That but is yes, exactly yes. right. That makes sense. Right. Yeah. So then my other question is, Muslims always say, for example, that they're not eating pork. By the way, I'm not yeah. eating pork either. I stopped eating it when I was a teenager. I wouldn't miss it. it. I never it, had man. bacon. I never had bacon in my life. I talked about this on my channel as well. When I was 14, 15 or so, I ate ham without knowing it because I thought it's chicken breast. And I puked. So I don't know where it came. But because uh. I always want to experiment and understand what truth is, even back in the day, I bought the same ham again just to see if I'm really puking off this ham. So mm. I puked again. And I then did. I started researching. And I read the Old Testament, and I saw that there are laws that you yeah. shouldn't eat pork, right? Even within the Bob, Old Testament. Look, look at how beautifully Allah is guiding you. Yeah, thank from God. your from your childhood, from your teen at the time, yes. Allah was showing you the truth. You know, Allah was putting that in your heart to see the truth, and that's a beautiful thing. Us sitting here is not a coincidence. There's no such thing as no, a coincidence in life. No, there is no such Allah. Thing brought you through all of that Christian background and Hindu and Buddhist to the truth of Islam and brought, you know, uh, to be very honest with you, we get a lot of requests from a lot of different YouTube personalities to do interviews and I hardly ever, ever do them. I just, I don't have time. And I mean, I don't get paid by OMF. I don't get paid by my mosque. I have a job. I got four kids, all of that, right? Mashallah. But I reached out to you <laughs> uh, because... When I saw a little clip and a very sincere person who, who showed me the clip, uh, may Allah reward them for it, I saw that you had that sincerity to find the truth. And that's something beautiful that Allah took you through that. So go ahead about eating pork and the, and the law. No, thank you very much for that, man. I was really wondering because I didn't reach out to you. You reached yes. out to me and I was wondering because I've seen people reacting to Islam, talking about it from a Christian background. I was really wondering, so thank you for clarifying that. By and... the way, you're the only YouTuber I've reached out to ever. Wow, that's amazing. It's an honor, man. Thank you very much, brother. I appreciate it. Honor for me. Yeah, so as I was saying, I puked twice. I experimented. I wanted to realize that. Then I started researching, saw in the Old Testament that pork was forbidden, and out of a sudden it is not anymore. I knew that Muslims are not eating pork. Then I found out that the Jews are not eating pork either. That was new <laughs> to me as a teenager. And that was basically it. Even back then I said, there is a clear contradiction here. And I was a teenager, and I right. wasn't even deeply religious, but I was identified as a Christian. I said, that is a contradiction, so I'm not going right. to eat pork anymore. And my uncles, they're butchers, they were eating <laughs> pork every single day. Yeah. But I just said no right then, right there, right? So yeah. I didn't have pork in the past over 20 years. I never I'm touched good. it again, because it didn't make sense to me. Yeah. That's beautiful. Look, um, Allah made haram for us those things that are not good for us. Right, know? makes sense. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I was taking a class, a health class, when I was doing my master's here in the U.S. And they had a, they had a study done, and they said the worst meat for you is pork. Sure. A meat that even if you cook the heck out of it, there's going to be parasites. There's a guy here in San Diego that got a worm in his head from eating a pork taco, right? Bah. Allah didn't make something haram because it hurts Allah. No, Allah is the master of the universe. He's the owner of everything. He wants right. us to live a pure, clean life. So when Jesus, according to Christian theologians and professors that I've spoken with, lived on this earth, um, according to Christians, he didn't eat pork. You know? right. It was Paul that was like, yeah, you know, uh, you know because he knew. <laughs> come on, come you know, on now. <laughs> come on, right, right, exactly. Yeah, circumcision, your Romans don't like to be circumcised, so forget that, you know. Uh -huh. So so you see how the Christian faith was, was manipulated and changed and perverted to fit uh, a Roman or a European mindset to gain yeah. followers. In True. Islam, we don't do that. We stick to the to original message. Um, now, 
there one second many... that is Go actually ahead. sorry that is actually very powerful because to this very day you will see christian quote-unquote nationalists that will identify with christianity because it is also european and islam is right. also foreign to europe not realizing that they stem of course from the same place but yes there are a lot of adaptations made to please the europeans and to make it comfortable for them and to appear right. as a quote-unquote european and white religion right and the yes, thing with yes. islam is Islam is not an Arab religion. I'm not Arab, right? Mm -hmm. I learned Arabic because I wanted to read the Quran in its original language. But less than 14% of the Muslim world is Arab. And wow. even those most are not originally Arab, like uh, Morocco, Algeria, Northern Africa, they're not originally Arab. Mm -hmm. They speak Arabic today, but they're not original Arabs. Um, most Muslims, the, the biggest Muslim populations today are going to be in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, mm -hmm. these areas. And then you're going to have the India, Pakistan area. So really, nationalism should have nothing to do with your belief set. You know, Europe Absolutely. was pagan way before it was Christian. That doesn't mean paganism is a European religion, right? But mm. go ahead. Yeah, back to the initial question is that many Muslims, especially back in the day, in my surroundings would pride themselves we are not eating pork we are not yeah. drinking alcohol uh, it's cool man but how about the rest i was wondering how about the rest of the mosaic law i have Excellent one quote question. here of jesus himself when he says don't mis misunderstand why i have come i did not come to abolish the law of moses or the writings of the prophets no i came to accomplish their purpose right so i was just wondering as muslims why not keep all of them great question um we keep everything that is confirmed in the Quran. But we do know that many of the Mosaic laws were changed and many mm -hmm. were introduced later. Um, like we were talking about what we see practice in Judaism today, a lot of it is not actually from the law. Actually, it's from the writings of their rabbis. Um, you know, very there are some very, very strange practices. And again, everybody... Um, has their own ideas of strange, but, you know, taking live chickens and putting them on your head or, or you know, some of the uh, some of the ways of circumcision. I mean, I don't know yes. if you know. I, know. <laughs> uh, I, know. So I, won't I don't know deep. if we can talk about this on YouTube, but I know, yes. Right, so let's, uh, yeah. let's not, but let me just say this. There's a, a, a rabbi in New York, and this is a Jewish man who came to our table. The video is online, told us about mm. this. Um, he had herpes, and he gave herpes to all these kids because of the way he was using his mouth for circumcision Google purposes. It. Google it. I'm right? not going to say it. I don't want to get banned. But but the whole point here is that those we don't find as original. Right? We see these are corruption. So what do yeah. we do? Is We look at that and we see what does the Quran and what does the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, peace and blessings be upon him, confirm and we keep those. So we are circumcised. Nobody's mouth is involved in it, but we are circumcised. <laughs> Uh, we, we do have, uh, we don't eat pork. We have halal, which is not exactly the same as kosher because kosher, some of the laws are not from the Torah. They're made up. Uh, we do stick to the, the humane uh, method of raising and killing animals. We do believe we, we eat animals. Alhamdulillah. We have canines. We're not vegetarians. We're not vegans. Uh, but Thank we God. do believe, yeah, Alhamdulillah. Uh, <laughs> we do believe in uh, a humane way, which is the halal way. So those laws that are confirmed, yes, we keep to. Those laws that we don't know that they may have been corruptions that were added and so on, we can't follow because a lot of those really don't make sense. Some of the marital laws, I don't know if you know about some of the, the sheet and the shaving of the heads and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff that they've, this yes. is really things that they've kind of made up. So we can't follow mm -hmm. those. That is something that I encountered in Sydney, quite interesting. They had a big Jewish community in Australia and the women would shave their heads yeah. and then for the rest of their life wear a wig. Yeah, very expensive wig. But yeah, yeah, but what's the logic? It's, in this? <laughs> the idea <laughs> is that they're supposed to cover their head, yes. cover their self. So they made a little trick. <laughs> yeah, they shave the head and they wear a wig, and they say, "Well, technically, you know, it's not my hair, but mm -hmm. you can't fool God. You can't." You know, it's like yeah, the whole thing exactly. in the Quran about putting your nets in on Friday and taking it out on Sunday. Well, you're not supposed to fish on Saturday. You can't trick God. You know. But th right, this is right. why we don't follow those mosaic laws. But whatever mm -hmm. is confirmed with the Quran and Sunnah, yes, we follow. 
Yeah, it's quite interesting. I'm paraphrasing here as well. In the old law, it says that a woman should cover. If she doesn't cover, she should shave her head, right? If yes. that defiles her, then she should cover, of course. That's and actually yeah, that's, that's actually a verse in the trick. New Testament. Yeah, that's Isn't actually it's mm -hmm. in the New Testament. Yeah, it's very and I show that to a lot of Christians, and mm -hmm. we don't see anybody practicing on that today. Um, no. But the Judaic laws of hijab of covering is also very different because their covering is even in front of the husband. And even when they're mm. sleeping and so on. And and mm. we believe that's a corruption. Like that's something that's been changed. Because that's in the Quran, a woman covers outside to protect her from the evil eyes of those that would mean her harm. But with her mm -hmm. husband, that's her husband. I mean, do whatever you like. That's that's what the marriage is for, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So. That is very, very interesting, man. I didn't know about the covering in front of the husbands. That's very yeah, strange. Yeah. Yeah, I had I had a PowerPoint that had I uh, listed all the rabbis' writings on this and stuff. And again, these are the corruptions of the original laws of Moses. And peace and you mentioned you mentioned halal slaughter there. For people that don't know, shame on me. But I was a vegan myself. I experimented uh. with that as well for quite some years. Yes, it failed miserably. And <laughs> I talked about that extensively on my YouTube channel as well. Nice. I was a vegan for four years straight, wrecked my health completely, and I did it. Mm right because i'm a fitness trainer as well certified etc so i right. tracked my nutrients and i really wanted to make it work right protein calories everything and then in the end destroyed pretty much everything in my body teeth mm. digestion depressed etc etc quitting veganism actually led me to god because i realized I was, I was looking into the science and the science was pointing towards a plant-based diet but within the old scriptures, it says we shall eat meat, right? Yeah. So I said, wow, apparently science is not the ultimate truth after all here. And it didn't work, even though I did it right. Anyways, yeah. my question would be about halal slaughter. I've seen a bit about it, but how is it practiced? Is it truly humane for the animal? Maybe that's interesting for vegetarians that are looking sure. into eating meat again. I mean, the thing, if, if any of the viewers here are vegans or vegetarians, Look, let's just be honest, right? We have canines. These would not be there if if we as humans were not meant to eat meat. If the creator, the designer, even if you don't want to believe in God, even if you want to go by nature, um, mm. cows don't have canines, right? They, right. They, um, lions do, right? Uh, what do lions eat meat? So yes, we have uh, the back teeth that we can chew uh, vegetables and rice and wheat. No problem with that. Um, but we also have canines. That's just the natural designs of humans. And there are nutrients, as you have mentioned, and you've experimented and seen that you just can't get without meat. And is this true? And, and you will find all kinds of unnatural ways of trying to get proteins in trying to live a natural life. Like, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense, right? There um, is no, there is no vitamin A, no vitamin B12, no vitamin D3, well, no DHA, EPA, no K2. There is nothing on those sorts. Of course, no cholesterol, carnosine, carnitin, right. none, none of it in plants. So you have to supplement your diet every single day. And there is no study done on a long-term effect of right. supplementation either. So it's all good. And, and look, uh, from a humane perspective, when they say, I don't want to kill an animal, look, Go out and look in nature. There is yes. a system. Are you going to stop lions from killing animals then? Are you going to stop uh, uh, coyotes from killing animals? Like, like This is not something that's up to us to make. God made the system. It works. Use the system as it is. Now, um, regarding halal, I'm going to be very blunt. Right? The, sure. when, when you slaughter an animal and you kill an animal, it's, not, it's never going to be uh, where it's just like, you know, flowers and clouds and things. Flowers, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if you cut a plant, you know, you know, when you, when you mow grass, the, the smell is actually a, a scream or, or a call for help that the grass sends out, you know, like animals mm. have, uh, plants have feelings, you know, this is something that many scientists have proven now. Right. So the point being in the end, yes, there, there is a, a somewhat, um, unpleasant thing you're going to have to go through. Right. But the system in the West where they electrocute them or they shoot them in the head with nail guns or they, you know, bam them with metal doors. And there's a documentary called Food Inc. where they show this horrible condition that they keep animals in. That's mm. torture. That's that's inhumane. That is against Islam. It's against, I think, anybody whose fitrah, whose natural state would understand. 
In Islam, we are told to raise the animals in a way that is befitting, meaning the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he saw even an animal overburdened, he got upset. He told them, you can't overburden an animal. When he saw people riding an animal that wasn't meant to be ridden, he told him, this is not for that. You can't mm -hmm. misuse animals. You can't just pump them full of hormones and, you know, never let them walk like the chickens that, you know, their feet cracked because they were pumped. This is against yep. Islam. In Islam, we want to give them a humane life. And at the time of death, the Prophet, peace be upon him, this is why I love Islam, because everything goes back to evidences. He, he saw a, a companion sharpening a knife to mm -hmm. slaughter a, an animal, and the animal could see the knife. The Prophet told him, are you going to kill the poor animal twice? Meaning, don't mm -hmm. let him even see the, 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 the blade. He told him, sharpen the blade so it's quick, painless, and it's done where the animal doesn't know it's going to go into that state. Meaning, you don't mm -hmm. let the animal know. So out of the ways of slaughter, it is the most humane. And I have slaughtered animals myself. And I can mm. tell you in a few minutes, it's done. And I have gone to slaughterhouses in the West where I have seen the hours that animal goes through agony being shot in the head with a nail. So in Islam, yes, we are meant to eat meat for humans. We do it in the most humane way possible, in a way that the animal lives a good life, a life where it's free range, where it can walk around, where it can enjoy its life. And then at a time, uh, you know, where it's slaughtered, it doesn't even know it's going to be slaughtered. So it doesn't have that agony reaching up to it. The slaughtering is fast. It's done. The blood gushes out. It doesn't feel the pain. So in the way of slaughter, it's the most humane way. I've seen it. I've done it. And I have never seen anything as easy as it in other ways of slaughter. In Mass slaughtering houses, you see chickens is put on sure. and you see a machine going and the chickens are freaking out and the machine misses and they throw them many a times in, uh, mm. you know, a huge electric, uh, electrocuted bucket and it's going through all that pain. To us, that's, that's inhumane. That's not something that we feel is the correct way to do things. So we feel that the Islamic method is definitely the best method and the only way that we would see to be as humane as possible uh, in a way that we understand that, you know, this is a slaughtering process. It's not something sure. that's easy uh, in the sense that it's not going to be like totally, uh, you know, nothing. But mm. it, like I said, I, I've been to many slaughterhouses. I've been to places in San Diego. I've been to places uh, in L.A. up the five freeway. And you go into some of these places and the method they keep these poor animals in and the way that they torture them at the time of death, it's just horrible. And then I've been in Pakistan and I've seen, you know, when, when, you know, when we have the Eid, we have the slaughtering of the, of the, of the sheep and the goat and the meat that's given to charity and so on. You know, in a minute, they take the poor animal out. The animal doesn't know it's kept away from the other animals that are dead. In two minutes, it's done. It's the past, and then you take that meat, you slaughter it up right there, you give it out. So it really, if somebody researches it, it is definitely the most humane way. Great answer. Okay, let's get into my personal, I would say, challenge in researching Islam. Excellent. Because when I read the Quran, for me, it was so external to everything that I witnessed within my life. As I said, I had negative experiences with Muslims. I would have never expected the Quran to say what it says. I didn't expect the Quran to even speak about the worship of one God, believe it or not. That was the biggest surprise to me personally. Aside from that, once I started looking into the Quran, I found that Islam doesn't have only the Quran, but it has hadiths as well, right? Yes. Yes. And since the Quran is the word of God, and I know you heard this question a million times before, but nevertheless, sure, for me personally, it's still so strange that then I would need hadiths in order to complement it, right? And I heard Excellent. that you are into hadith sciences. Yes, or yes. You have a I, have a, I have a master's in hadith. And uh, perfect, these books perfect. that you see here, these are all hadith books. So perfect. we have a, the whole section here is on hadith, yes. So That's my basic question. question is, what is the importance of hadiths? That's basically Excellent. it. Excellent yeah. question. So when we see a verse from the Quran, um, we know many people today will want to misuse that verse. Right? Okay. Uh, the verse will be explicit. For example, uh, you know, the, the verse about 
uh, it, to prepare the seeds of war against your enemy. But if they incline towards peace, then incline towards peace, right? What Islamophobes do is they'll cut off the next verse or they'll cut out that context. And mm. uh, interestingly, uh, it's the Khawarij or the extremists amongst the Muslims who do the same thing. <laughs> they will sure. take that verse out of context. And the Islamophobes, the anti-Islam people do the exact same thing. They, they kind of mm -hmm. come together on that uh, misuse <laughs> of the Qur'an. So what do they do? They'll take that verse out of context and then they will use it where it should not be. Right? Mm -hmm. So here, this is the beautiful thing about hadith. And uh, I'll explain a little bit about hadith first. I'll just tell you what's the point. It gives you that context. It gives you that reference so people don't misuse the words of Allah. So when mm -hmm. we say غير عليهم والضالين, those that uh, يعني, we don't want to be on the path of those that earned the wrath of Allah or those that went astray, who are those? So if we don't right. have hadith, then everybody will come up with their own. Ibn Arabi, for example, he gave some strange meaning. You know, other people like that, uh, they will give their own strange meanings. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, explained that مغضوب عليهم is the Jews and ضالين are the Christians. So now we have a clear reference mm. to understand the context of the verse. Mm -hmm. Hadith also tell us about some verses that were during battle. And that's why I was telling you about some of the Sahaba, the companions. They said, yes, we were there when this revealed, this verse was revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and it was during battle. So then that tells us you can't take that verse and put it in during peacetime. Sometimes mm -hmm. or during travel. So Hadith really gives us the context needed. The Quran tells us, pray. That's, that's the order of Allah. Okay. But what are the minute details about the prayer? How am I going to fold my hand? How am I going to go into Rukur? What verses am I going to recite? That is going to come in Hadith. Mm -hmm. If all those rulings were in the Quran, now, look, look, these are books of Hadith, right? Imagine yeah. the Quran had all this in it. Yeah. How would we memorize it? You know, how would we who is going to memorize Exactly. Mm -hmm. so the Quran is the words of Allah. It's perfect. It's revealed. Hadith, there are weak Hadith. You know, sometimes they're weak. That's why we have a whole, and I have a whole section in the library over there, and my particular passion is in the science of grading hadith and classifying mm -hmm. hadith. It's called ilm rijal and mustalal hadith. So unlike Christianity where you're like, ah, we don't know who wrote it, but it's in the Bible now. No, for us, mm -hmm. if we don't know who narrated the hadith, it's called majhul. It's an unknown narrator. We can't accept it, right? So in hadith, we have books like Al-Bukhari and Muslim, who we know to be a compilation of authentic hadith. Then you have great works of hadith that have some weak hadith. And we reference to know which ones are weak and which ones are strong. And we don't rely upon weak or fabricated or unknown narrators kind of hadith. We only <laughs> accept that which is authentic. And it gives us that context needed to practice our daily life. Right. For me, my questioning is because I come from a Christian background, not trusting Paul necessarily, right? Of course. I'm seeing him as somebody that innovated. I agree. When when were the hadiths written down? How can I trust them? Excellent question. E um, even if they're sorry, even if they're graded <clears throat> as Sahih, if they're graded as okay, we accepted them. But when was that accepted? Excellent, what? excellent question. Um, the hadith were written down during the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him. There is clear references where he told Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib, companion, who was his cousin and all, yes. one of the earliest followers, to write down the rulings that have to do with accidental death and so on and send mm -hmm. it to a certain people. So that was written down as hadith, meaning his statement, during the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him. During the earlier time, the Prophet forbid writing down his words. Because the companions would be writing down, memorizing the Qur'an, and he didn't mm -hmm. want that his words are confused with the Qur'an. In the early times, they didn't know. Like if he said something, they may assume it's in the Qur'an. So he said, no, just write down the Qur'an. In the later times, he, the Prophet, peace be upon himself said, and there's a clear statement where he said, look, earlier I forbid you, now I allow you, because nothing comes from this mouth, meaning what he's been revealed, except the truth. So in the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him, hadith were written down. And then after that time, the companions like Abu Huraira and others, they memorized, like the mm -hmm. Quran was memorized. They realized when the Prophet used the Quran in prayer and told them that this is the Quran. So they had, by the consensus of the companions, 114 chapters, 30 Jews of the Quran. So the other statements of Prophet they also memorized and they wrote down and they had suhuf, they had these scrolls that some of these students 
of the first generation. This is talking about Sahaba. They had written down. Now, during the very early time, there is a book that I have it here. This is called the Mutta of Imam Malik. Imam Malik was very early on. In the first hundred years, he compiled an entire work, categorized, and each hadith, it takes the, and this is Arabic and English, but you see it takes the chain all the way back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, that means in the first generation, we already had complete works. In the first hundred years, somebody from the first, uh, any early times, between him and the Prophet, sometimes there's only two narrators, where he mm -hmm. will say, and Nafi'a said, Abdullah ibn Umar said, the Prophet said, right? So they had written down complete works. And every work of hadith that's an original work will give you the chain of narrators, unlike Paul, who never met Jesus. That or chain was... is broken. Unlike only the... in a dream. Only in a dream. And we, like mm. in hadith, we don't rely on dreams. Mm. right? Unless you physically heard, saw uh, something, we don't accept it in hadith. right? So right. even if you look at the, the earliest biblical manuscripts that are written in 4th century, that means between that and even Paul's time, you have a huge gap of unknown people. Not in hadith. Um, let me show you a book here. This is Sahih al-Bukhari. Uh, mm -hmm. The point I will make, if you look at the, the hadith, it's not just from Imam Bukhari. It will go all the way to the Abu Hur radiallahu anhu, who said, I heard the Prophet, peace be upon him. So you mm -hmm. see, the chain is going to be all the way. So there is, there is no writing later. They were compiled maybe later, but the chain will go all the way to the Prophet. Meaning, who did they hear it from? Who did they hear it from? Who did they hear it from? All the way to the Prophet. If the chain is missing a link, that's a weak narration. We can't accept it. Right? So these were written down in the earliest generations. There were complete works that were put together like books in the first hundred years that we have. And even the later works will give you the chain all the way back to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Now, each person in that chain, we have their biography. I have an entire other section of the library that, that is Ilm al-Rijal. This is just the biographies of the narrators. So each person in that chain, I can pull his biography or her biography. When were they born? Where did they live? Wives, husband, children, what they did for work, how trustworthy were they? How good was their memory? And then we don't just rely on one chain. We have some ahadith that have 70 independent chains. So it's a very precise science. I mean, like I said, I have a master's in it. There's PhDs you can do in it. That mm -hmm. goes through a whole checking. So unlike in Christianity or other religious traditions, where you kind of just go with like, well, that's what the church father said. Uh, it's right. not like that in Islam. So for somebody from the outside like myself, when Bukhari that you just showed, so I think his complete name is Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari. He was a Persian, right? And he compiled yes. it yes. In, in 846 or something like that. That's right. Wikipedia. So yeah, well, I mean, yeah. In, we go by Hijri dates, so it's two hundred something Hijri uh, after the time of the of the of the migration of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Yeah. Okay. When he compiles those hadiths, what does he have in front of him? Just for my understanding, I really excellent. Does it? Does he have so, text in front of him? Does he have people? Excellent. How does he compile them? Great, great question. So Imam Bukhari, he has teachers that have memorized that teach him word by word, letter by letter. And they will tell him who did they memorize it from, who did they memorize it from, all the way back to the Prophet. Uh -huh. He also has actual books, because like I mentioned, the Muatta of Imam Malik is almost a hundred years about before Imam Bukhari. Mm -hmm. So these works are already written down, right? And even before the Muatta, you have the writings. There is a scholar named Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He's a very uh, strong and instrumental scholar. He's one of the teachers of Imam Bukhari, meaning Imam Bukhari reported a hadith from Imam Ahmad. Imam mm -hmm. Ahmad has a book called the Musnad Imam Ahmad. It's on the other side of the library, but it is actually bigger than Al-Bukhari. It's about 40,000 narrations. Mm -hmm. And that was already written down. So Imam Bukhari mm -hmm. has those written references in front of him. He also mm -hmm. has the verbal, the oral tradition in front of him that he memorizes. Imam Bukhari memorized around two to three hundred thousand ahadith, right? From memory. 
And from that, he collected only about 2,700 something to be in his Sahih. So mm-hmm. before him, scholars of Hadith have already written books. You know, mm-hmm. this is the this is the lie that some people oh hadith weren't written until 200 300 years later that's just that's just a lie anybody mm-hmm. with academic honesty would know that imam malik being in the first 100 years from hijri this is from the the way from the not even from the death of the prophet peace be upon him and his teacher mm-hmm. imam zohri and the earlier imma like uh, imam uh, abu huraira who was a companion his students had written down scrolls imam ahmed the teacher imam bukhari says in the musnad that I saw this hadith written down in the handwritings of the students of the companion. Mm-hmm. Meaning even in his time, they had written records that they were able to verify reports with. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. This is pretty uh, impressive. Uh, the hadith scientists, like we don't have time to get into it in depth here, yeah, sure. are so accurate that I can tell you that if I was to take the scientific method of clinical trials, and the science of judging hadith, the science of judging hadith is more precise. Wow. Many Muslims are just ignorant about it. That's true. They use weak mm-hmm. hadith and things. That's just because they're ignorant. But if you spend the time to study it, and inshallah, after you become Muslim, I'll set up a special class for you uh, where <laughs> I'm going to go over these with you. You will realize that in hadith science, there is no doubt, right? It is such a precise science. We have this thing called mutawatir, and we have so many different ways of judging a hadith that it is amazing. It's beyond the scope of this conversation, but I have videos. I have uh, on our Majid Ribad channel, we have, uh, uh, I think it's seven or eight short introduction called the Science of Grading Hadith Made Easy. Once you go through that, you will be amazed. You'll be amazed because in a clinical trial, that I, I work in on pharma and med device, we don't mm-hmm. go through that much precaution like the scholars of hadith did. That's mm-hmm. how accurate it is. Um, and that's why in Islam we rely on it. Uh, but again, the Quran is the words of Allah. Quran, there is no mm-hmm. doubt. No hadith can be contradictory to Quran. When people say this hadith is contradictory to the Quran, it's just either they're ignorant of the, of the authenticity of the hadith or the application of the hadith, that's just their ignorance, you know, and that's why we have scholars who spend a lifetime studying these things and teaching these things. So that's amazing. You mentioned the contradictions to the Quran. My question would be when I was reading the Quran, the topic of four wives, for example, doesn't pop sure. up explicitly, right? And by the way, guys, I have no issues with four wives, I would like to have four <laughs> wives as well. But other than that, Allah bless we, you for it, God knows. It's a lot of work as well. Though. Anyways, the way that I understood it is in the Quran, and correct me again if I'm wrong here, that the, there is a the verse Quran in the Quran. Orphans, right? Like when somebody no, but, has to take but care there is of a orphans. verse he says to marry two, three, or four, but if you cannot, then one, right? So mm-hmm. that ruling is in the Quran itself about uh, polygamy. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ also in a hadith mentioned it. But the Quran itself does give that. Uh, leeway, not just for orphans, even though it is sometimes definitely in the context of people that are in need, right? Mm -hmm. But even if you look in the earlier traditions, if you look at Solomon, if you look at David, if you look at the Old Testament, it's filled with polygamy. There's nothing um, in the earlier religious traditions that stops it. Uh, In the Quran, there's a clear verse that tells you two, three, or four, and if you're unable to be just, then one is best, and that Mm -hmm. is the natural state. You have Adam and Eve, you have one, one, great. If you're happy with one wife, great. You're happy, she's happy, live your life, right? But no doubt, till today, there is a need. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, in Iraq recently, there was a war, as we Mm. know, and many of the men were killed, and many uh, women, unfortunately, these documentaries were forced into prostitution and things that they really shouldn't be because they had no way to make a living. There, There was no economy, there was no Men were out there fighting each other, you know, with guns and whatever. Women couldn't. So we in Islam don't believe in that hypocrisy where you put a woman in that state. In mm-hmm. in, in the West, and I mean in Europe, and you've lived in Europe and in other countries, what there is it is a hypocrisy, right? They will say, "Oh, polygamy! Oh, how could you?" <laughs> but if a man has thirty girlfriends, there's no there's no problem with them. And, no and which which president hadn't had mistresses? I mean. Sure. If you talk about Donald Trump having sex with a porn star while his wife was pregnant, that somehow is legal. 
But if sure. she was to get a second wife, that would that would be like, oh no, you know. Mm. Bill Clinton, and actually no. marry her, actually marry her, right? Ooh, Openly bad. and no <laughs> secret marriages. I mean, this is something right. that should be done open. Look, if, if Bill Clinton's in the Oval Office doing whatever with Lewinsky, he still stays the president. He doesn't even get mm. any right. But if he was to say, hey, you know what? Uh, I want to take a second wife. I want to be open about it. I don't want to do it hidden. Then, oh, that's that's horrible, right? All these yeah. massage parlors and strip clubs and dance clubs and what happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas and all this stuff, all this mm. underhanded, hip hypocritical, all these church leaders that get found out in hotel rooms with prostitutes, that all goes on and we try to try to blind the eye to it. In Islam, mm -hmm. we don't believe in that. Look, if you're happy with your wife and she's happy with you, great, live your life. And that's 99% of the Muslim world. I mean, if you go to the Muslim world, you will hardly, in most Muslim countries, you will hardly see polygamy because that's is just the way people live. But sure. if there is a situation that in a halal, in a clear way, in a permissible way, without trickery and all that, you can have a second wife, great. I mean, if, if they're all happy with it, well, why do we have a problem with it, right? Yeah, it makes sense. No, you see a lot of hypocrisy like that in the West, of course. Yeah. People being against, as I said, marrying women, right, and making right. them honest women. But as a woman or a man nowadays, you can be promiscuous as much as you want to be and yeah. swipe on Tinder left and right and have a good exactly. time, quote unquote. No exactly. worries. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Anyways, now we're going to get into the nitty gritty, speaking about sexuality. This is something that I heard from David Wood himself, right? And mm -hmm. the first things that you hear from those Islamophobes or anti-Islamists, call them what you will, mm -hmm. is always violence, sexually charged comments, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So before I mention the sexually charged comments, I don't know what al Khan fi ulum al Quran is, right? That oh. is the source. I want to start like that first and foremost. What is that source? And then we can read out the comment if you want to. Yeah. Let me get it for you. I have it, actually. Awesome. Unlike David Wood, I actually have books. I don't just <laughs> Google them. He has the internet uh -huh. at his disposal. But he disappeared. He's not <clears throat> online anymore. Yeah. <sighs> Yes, so this is Al Itqan fi Ulum al Quran, Imam mm -hmm. al Siyuti, who is uh, from around the ninth, 900 Hijri, meaning okay. about 900 years after the Prophet, peace be upon him. Right. Um, and you can see I have studied this book quite extensively. This is a book dedicated to the sciences of how you explain the Quran. Mm -hmm. And how you understand that it's not a Quran uh, tafsir, it's not a it's hadith not tafsir. book, it is not, not a tafsir. tafsir. Oh, okay. it is, no, no. So, so this is this is this is why the problem with Islamophobes they don't actually know what they're talking about. Mm. They Google things. They don't know Arabic. They don't know the text. Uh, David Wood doesn't know what this book. If I showed this to him, he wouldn't know the what book it is. Yeah, sure. Let alone be able to read it, right? So this is a book that just goes over uh, the different scientists about the Quran. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even explain the Quran itself. It just tells oh, you wow. how explanation is done, how mm -hmm. the Quran was compiled, how the companions memorize the Quran, how uh, you know different sciences of the writing of the Quran, how the different lettering and the meanings and those things. It's, it's about the sciences, ulum of Quran. It's not mm -hmm. a Quran book. It's not a tafsir book, it's not a hadith book, it's not a fiqh mm. book, it's not Jewish book, none of that. When I heard this statement made at first, I thought, oh, that's in the Quran, All right? Yeah. Then I looked further into it, then I thought, oh, okay, it's in the hadith. And now my latest research, I was like, oh, okay, that's a tafsir then, it must be an explanation, but it's not even that. It is not, yeah. And again, um, oh. if we go through the different chapters, Yanni, it will talk about uh, the the difference between abrogation and abrogation. It will talk about the differences between uh, some of the different ways of recitation. Um, mm -hmm. it, this is a section about those companions that memorize the Quran by heart. Um, mm -hmm. I've got my own notes with it, obviously. But this is not a book we rely upon for tafsir itself. I have mm -hmm. a whole section that has tafsir ibn Kathir and Tabari and 
Uh, Imam al-Sayyuti, the author of this book, also wrote a tafsir book. He wrote a mo- few tafsir uh, books. One is called al uh, and he has another one, uh, Qatf al-Azhar, which is a two-volume, very rare one. I have it as well. And other books, uh, uh, Tafsir al-Mathur and so on. This is not one of them. So, go ahead. What's That's very book? interesting. So it has been written 900 years after the prophets on top. Yeah? Yes, yes. And again, it's not a hadith book. It, it doesn't have any chain of narration for hadith. Um, it's just more giving. It even gives you sometimes contradictory opinions to explain to you how how those opinions are, are merged or understood, which one is stronger and so on. Okay. All right. The quotes. Each time we sleep with a huri, we find her virgin. Besides, the penis of the elected never softens. The erection is eternal. The sensation that you feel each time you make love is utterly delicious and out of this world. And were you to experience it in this world, you would faint. Each chosen one, i.e. Muslim, will marry 70 huris besides the woman he married on earth. And all will have appetizing vaginas. Okay, what's the reference in it? Because I have it here with me. Uh, yeah, and, the, and the up. reference, the reference again, according to David Wood, was Al Iqtan fi Al Quran, page three hundred fifty-one. Okay, is it a volume or it just gives you a page? That's the only information I got. Hmm. So that's interesting. Um, three hundred and fifty-one, you said. Three hundred and fifty-one is. So I have the whole Itqan here. It's the original is actually in three volumes. Um, mm-hmm. None of those volumes go past three hundred and twenty. Well, okay. So this volume, the must first be the special pages then. Ends right. <laughs> this is the second volume that begins here, which goes to the end of it, which is two hundred and seventy-eight. It ends. It is the third volume, and it goes on to 279, and then okay. it ends. So, and then the last volume here ends at 242, first off, right? Mm-hmm. So this is a four-volume work. I have it printed in one volume. I none of those references would make any sense because you couldn't look it up in the actual book. I don't know where you Googled it from. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that's not a verse in the Quran that I know of. If it's in the Quran, let them know. That's not a hadith explicitly by those words. I've never heard that hadith. If there is, I'd love to see it in a book of hadith so we can look at Mm -hmm. the chain of narrations. If it's a statement of Imam al-Shiyuti himself or if he's referencing somebody else, those are people's statements, right? Mm-hmm. In the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, we don't find anything like this with those no. wording, right? So this is really them. But but since we're on the subject of uh, sex and sexualization and things, I've got a Bible. I'm not talking about some Christian scholars writing 900 years after Jesus or some priests in some monastery with some boy. I don't mean all that. Let's leave all that aside. Let's take the Bible itself. Let's talk about Lot and him having drunken sex with his daughters. Isn't that in the... I'm not... Again, I would love to see David Wood come and bring me a verse from the Quran and I believe in it and I'll explain it. Or an authentic hadith from the Prophet, from Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah, and Nisai, Jamia, Imam Ahmad, uh, Al-Bazaar, any of these books of hadith and give the chain and we'll look at that because they're weak hadith as well. Mm. But from the Bible itself, you're talking about a, a man who's called a righteous man in the New Testament. So don't try to get out of, oh no, you know, yeah. having repeated, not one night, multiple nights, drunken sex with two different daughters, that's incest. Well, let's talk about David. I mean, if you talk about David, you know, he, in, in the in the Old Testament, you will see that he looked at a woman taking a bath. This is in the Bible, right? And we can give you references if you like. I mean, I, I can go get my Bible and show you right now. No, no, I know them. Right? 
Um, and, and he likes this woman, and he's called a prophet. Again, mm -hmm. they try to, oh, no, I've got a Bible verse. He's called a prophet. So David, who's in the New Testament, called a prophet, he sees this woman. She's taking a bath. She's a married woman. Mm -hmm. And he brings her, and he, whether by force or not, or, you know, he has sex with her, and her husband is a soldier in David's army. And this mm -hmm. is a prophet in the Bible? And then, not not just that. I'm not talking about virgins in heaven. And so this is a somebody's wife. You're committing adultery with, with your own soldier's wife until she gets pregnant. And then mm -hmm. when he figures out she's pregnant, he has Job send her husband back, who is a righteous, good soldier. And then he sends a letter with him to Job and say, hey, put him in the front lines so he can be killed because <laughs> okay. I got his wife pregnant. <laughs> David, come on, man. You want to talk about perversion and sexuality, let's get the Bible uh, and let's take a look. Don't go to Alum al-Quran and a book that with a reference that you don't understand that's not in the Quran itself, the not in Sahih Hadith. Let's talk about the Bible. Right? So these things are just done in an Islamophobic manner. Mm. Most authentic Hadith will never have explicit wordings like penis and vagina. These you just don't find because they're not. you will not find such wording in the Quran or Sahih Ahadith in those words, right? Uh, right. You will have references to inter intercourse because obviously that's a part of human life, but it, it would, I have never found an authentic narration that mentions those wording. It's not in the Quran for sure. It's not in a book of Hadith that I've seen. I have never, I've studied the book and I didn't come across such a quote, but if it is in there, it's going to be in reference to somebody's statement, not to uh, original text itself. Right on. Yeah, I didn't know that, as I said, for me. And first, when I heard it from David Wood, I thought, okay, this is in the Quran, done deal. Yeah. Right? This this explains the 72 versions. And then now Which you're Which is also me, not in the Quran. No, it's not in the Quran. What yeah. are your thoughts on that? Uh, there is a hadith for it. And yeah. Yani, when we talk about uh, the uh, different things in, in hadith and things, there is context mm. to understand what does it mean to be a martyr and so on. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we do believe that there are spouses in paradise that are from the mm -hmm. women of paradise. Uh, but the Prophet, peace be upon him, also told us that the women of this world, the world will be your wives in paradise. So mm -hmm. if you are married and, you know, like the Prophet, nobody is a single person in, 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 in paradise. So if you're a woman who was never married, you will be married in paradise. You will live a happy life. If you're married to a woman in this world, then you and her both make it to paradise and you want to live together. It can be you and her and you can live your life. But and if you if you controlled your desires in this world and uh, Allah blesses you with uh, beautiful women in paradise, then that's something Allah blesses you with. Uh, you know, as as the other beautiful things of paradise are a reward. Um, nothing wrong with that. Let's continue with the claims of Islamophobes, etc., because those are the things that are consistently in my subconscious while researching Islam. You know, it is what it is. The only time that I really put my bias aside was when I was reading the Quran itself and it had a transformative effect on myself, right? Just by leaving the bias aside and just looking at it completely far, far away from what I saw in Germany or in Macedonia or whatnot. That was amazing. However, now further researching into it, I always get reminded of those claims, you know, be it David sure. Wood, be it whatever. Ask away. We'll clear those up before you're I'm gonna I'm going to line up the points the main right. points that they've made about Prophet Muhammad, and then Excellent. we can go through them point by go point. Go for it. Okay, so the claims are, again, allegedly, allegedly based on Bukhari, Muslim, and Kitab al-Hudud. So the first one is that prostitution was allegedly legalized by Prophet Muhammad. The next okay. one is he got poisoned by a Jew Jewish woman, which husband he killed. Then he killed hundreds of people, including children, in Banu Quraysha and mm -hmm. took the widowed women and girls as sex slaves. Then the next one has been discussed a billion times, Aisha's age. Mm -hmm. All right, Another so, so, one. Let, let's yeah. take them one by one. All right. Okay, let's take them one by one. Um, so first one, prostitution so, was allegedly legalized excellent. by Prophet Mount. That is, uh, and the reason he didn't bring that in front of me is because he knows that that's just a bold lie. There was a practice called muta, and this is mm -hmm. something the Shia, the Rafa yeah. still have, mm -hmm. which was a pre-Islamic practice, meaning ah. before Islam, this was a practice amongst the Arab, 
like drinking alcohol, like gambling. And right. it was forbidden in stages. There is a book in Sahih Muslim, which I have here, um, where in a hadith, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that this is something that was halal, that was permissible before because the ruling had not come. But now mm-hmm. Allah has made it haram till the Day of Judgment, oh. meaning it was forbidden. Now, many evils were there in, in Arab society, burying of, of daughters, right? And yeah. these things were forbidden by Islam, but in stages. Now mm-hmm. imagine if all the rulings, Aisha radiyanha, she has a beautiful hadith, that if all the rulings came at one time, people wouldn't be able to handle it. Right. People used to drink, they used to gamble, they used to do all kinds, they used to have prostitution. Uh, women would have multiple men that would come visit and they would just pick mm-hmm. one, this is the father, you know, all yeah. this kind of stuff. I read if, those. In one, if one day they said all of that's gone, people, human nature, they can't handle. It's like taking a kid uh, into kindergarten and telling him, here's here's a book on physics and, uh, you know, it's calculus. And uh, mm-hmm. no, you can't handle it. So everything, even the stopping of drinking alcohol was in stages. There was mm-hmm. a stage you just couldn't pray when you're drunk. There's a stage where you should better stay away with it. Stage completely forbidden, right? right? So like that, in stages, the practice of muta was made haram. First, it was mm-hmm. only in certain situations. Then it was allowed only during battles because the people couldn't uh, handle it. And then as the final ruling, as the ruling of Islam today, is muta was made haram till the Day of Judgment. That's in Sahih Muslim, the hadith from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Uh, so no, that claim is just totally false. That practice was there pre-Islam. Islam and the Prophet, peace be upon him, mm. forbid it. We as Muslims wow. today do not believe in prostitution. We don't believe in muta'ah. We don't believe in this. We have nikah, which is the marriage, the zawaj. And that's the only way for sexual intercourse is the proper Islamic halal way. That's one. Oh, that's uh, a next. very, very interesting explanation, man. Because I talk to Shias and they still practice it, apparently, where they yeah. marry a woman and then divorce her afterwards. Yeah, so the muta'ah doesn't actually have a um, marriage. They have a, they have a time contract. And oh, wow. unfortunately, this is something that they practice, but this is wrong. And uh, it's in Sahih Muslim, in the Quran, even when Allah revealed the, the, the verses about marriage and being the way, this means that those pre-Islamic practices were forbidden. If the Shia practice it, this is their mistake. But mm-hmm. the vast majority of the Muslims around the world, you will see, will clearly know based on the authentic Sahih Hadith, that this is something Allah made haram till the Day of Judgment. Right on. Let's continue. He got poisoned by a Jewish woman, which husband he killed. I was reacting okay. to a video just recently, and there, mm. I don't know exactly who it was, Zakir Naik, I believe. And mm. he said that Muhammad died a natural death. And for me, that was he a did. surprise, because I only heard that he got poisoned by that Jewish woman from David Wood. No, he, he, the, uh, I have a series on the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, among authentic sources, and we talk about the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He did not die as a direct result of the poisoning, even mm-hmm. though he felt the pain of some of that poisoning even at the time of death. But uh, regarding the woman herself, it, this was not something that caused the death directly, meaning it was not mm-hmm. like he got poisoned and then he died from it. But the poison had an effect and he felt some of the pains of it. And there's a great wisdom in that. His, his death was a natural death meaning that Allah had written for him and he died at that time. He was not killed, he was not stabbed, he was not shot, you know, that kind of thing. But Allah gave him the status of a martyr, even though it, Allah didn't allow that somebody in battle would take down his prophet, right? Mm-hmm. So, but he was given that status by having that he was poisoned earlier and he felt some of that pain from it so that he is given the status of a martyr without being killed in battle. If he was killed in battle, then people are like, oh, what kind of a prophet gets killed? Even though we know prophets are humans, humans die. But but this is the wisdom of Allah. And there's a deep wisdom in that. But his death was not directly due to the poisoning. That is incorrect. And uh, her husband being killed for the poisoning is incorrect. That's incorrect reference. Regarding, this will take us into Banu Quraida and Banu Nadir and Banu Qaynuqa and the, what happened at Khaybar. Um, and by the way, if you look up the One Message Foundation channel, I had a debate when I caught David Wood's ignorance in this, where he mm-hmm. didn't even realize that Khaybar was, was close to Medina. And mm-hmm. He didn't realize what happened. He thought as if the Prophet, peace be upon him, went into Khaybar and just massacred Jews. This is historically incorrect. 
And I mean, I have references that I marked to show him, but he, he ran away and never came back. And now the channel is gone. So I won't be able to show him. But I mean, if you like, I can bring them here, but I can just tell you about it. You can just tell me it's fine. The Battle of Khandak was a battle mm-hmm. when, the, when the Arab tribes from outside of Medina attacked Medina. There was okay. a contract amongst the people of Medina mm-hmm. that we will defend Medina together. Whether you're Muslim, whether you're Jewish, whether you're an idol worshiper, whatever you are, doesn't mm-hmm. matter. There was a peace treaty that we will not, if the Jews are attacked from outside, the Muslims would, would defend them. It was, a, it was to say that we are together as a community in Medina to protect Medina. And this okay. was a contract made. When the Battle of Khandak happened and the different Arab tribes attacked Medina, the Jews of Banu Quraida, Banu Qainuqa, Banu Nadir, these are three tribes, they betrayed that treaty. This is not mm-hmm. all Jews. This is a particular tribe that were a part of that treaty. Not only did they help the enemies, they sent them weapons, they sent them soldiers, and on top of that, they tried to attack the Muslim women and children during the battle because the men had gone out to dig a trench, that's why it's called Khandak, mm-hmm. so that people don't get, and Muslims and Jews were all protected by the Muslims there. But these Jews even tried to attack the Muslims, and this is, I have a book here, uh, I mean, I can show you some of the books on Syria that I had marked up to show, just so he understands, but because he's just Googling, he's not looking up actual books. Even the references he does, he gets from online sources and websites, which have a lot of mistakes. That's why we try to use books. So here, now, when the battle finished, and the Muslims realized that, a part, that the treason had taken place, then yes, those people that were involved in trying to attack Muslims, and helped the, the enemies, and they betrayed the treaty, they were killed as part of treason. That was part of the it deal. Makes sense. That was, makes sense. Women and children were not killed. This mm-hmm. is a lie. Women and children were not killed. Even some of the children that were involved in the fighting were left alive when they, because they were children. Some of them that were a little bit older where they could make their decisions, yes, they were, because they were a part of the, the force that was used in that treason and that attack on the Muslims during the Battle of Khandak. This is what happened. Now, other Jews in other parts of Arabia that still had treaties with Muslims, even after the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the time of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, عنهم, there were Jews that used to come in and interact with Muslims. This is a particular situation, a situation of war, where there was a treaty and there was a treason made, and those that did the treason were put to death, as was the contract between the Muslims and, and the people of Medina at the time. Fair enough. Okay, next one. Mm -hmm. Aisha's age. Age of Aisha. Excellent. I have a a longer video on this, so you can watch that for more details, but I'll give a brief answer. Regarding the age of Aisha, there is nothing in the Quran about it. There's no verse in the Quran that discusses her age. There's nothing from the Prophet, peace be upon him, where he mentioned her age. There's no hadith we call marfu' anywhere the Prophet, peace be upon him, said about her age. We do have narrations from her, and we have some in Bukhari, and we have some in Muslim. And there are some uh, discrepancies between those narrations. And not okay. Again, like I want to be very clear. I'm not denying those narrations because they are authentic. But what does that mean? That the chain of narrators do go back to her, and she made certain statements. Um, the one in Sahih Muslim, for example, uh, it mentions that she was seven at the age of engagement where the where the engagement took place and she was nine at the time of the actual consummation of marriage uh, the one in Bukhari one of them and another one in Sahih Muslim mentioned six and nine and so on so and these are authentic narrations uh, Imam Muslim he has Sahih Muslim the most famous explanation is called a Sharh of Sahih Muslim by Imam Al-Nabawi Imam Al-Nabawi a later scholar mm-hmm. but still a very classic scholar. He discusses the differences, why different ages were given and so on. So this is not something we're rewriting history with or something. Rather, what we do know is that ages were not well kept at that time because there was no calendar. Like imagine if I asked her age, but there was no date. There was no 1990, 1980, 2000, none of that, right? Basically, the Arabs would go by the events of a year, like the year of the elephant, where the elephants attacked Mecca or so on. Uh, 
Rose. when they would have certain events, they would kind of remember dates from that. That's why many of the companions, even Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, we have different opinions about her age at the time of marriage, ranging from 25 and 28, which is more authentic, to all the way mm -hmm. to 40. 40, right? Big range. Yeah. The, the narration for 40 is actually a weak narration, but you find mm -hmm. it in most of the history books. But the point being, until the Hijri calendar began in the time of Omar, meaning after mm -hmm. the, the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the death of Abu Bakr, and the time of Omar, the first Muslim calendar developed the Hijri, which we still use today. Mm -hmm. So how would she really know her age? Why did she give two different ages? Probably because this was an estimate based on what people told her. It doesn't mean that she's a weak narrator. She's a very strong narrator of Hadith. She's amazing. But obviously, she wasn't present-minded at her own birth, right? Meaning, if you ask me my age, I'm going to ask somebody like my mom or check my passport or my birth certificate. Well, if you don't have a passport or a birth certificate, not even a year numbering system, then basically you're going to rely upon other people, older sister. Uh, hey, you know, when was I born? Well, I think you were born around this eight years. You're about this age. It's going to be a, an approximate. And there are On some narrations. Note, even my father's generation, he doesn't exactly know when he was born. It's an estimate exactly. as well, and that's just one generation back in Macedonia. Exactly. I mean, even if you look at a lot of the Somali uh, citizens that we have in America today, all right. of their birth dates are January 1st. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what happened nine months before January 1st, but somehow they're... Because they didn't, in Somalia, they didn't really care. It just didn't really mm. matter to them. And when they came here, they just kind of put that as their birth date. So the point being, uh, that's not really something in the Quran or it's not a part of the Islamic belief, aqidah, as we say. Uh, it's not mm. something the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us. So this whole big deal that has been made is just trying to distract. What we do know of authentic hadith, that she was already engaged at that time. So that mm -hmm. means in the Arabian society, whatever age she exactly was, it was the age that girls would usually get engaged and they would wait till they were physically capable of uh, bearing children, which, you know, usually would be indicated through Haid, which is the menstrual cycle, which is the natural way of letting you know a woman is ready. Um, mm -hmm. And then they would go ahead and consummate the marriage. So that was society of that time. And that was correct. And none of the pagans, none of the enemies of Islam ever objected to that marriage as unusual for that society. So now yes. let's talk about recent time. My grandmother was married at 14. You know, mm -hmm. My other grandmother from other side was married at 12. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that is just like I said, and like you said, it's very recent. Mm -hmm. Now, today in America, we would find that unacceptable. Right. Mm -hmm. But. It is incorrect for us to judge history by our standards, right? Because Absolutely. today, why do we not have girls get married at 14 and 15, for example, is because yeah. they got to finish high school and they want to go mm. to college. Yeah, that's true. But in a society where you don't have high school, you don't have middle school, you don't have elementary school, you don't have uh, colleges, you don't have universities, once a boy is physically capable, he gets married. Once yes. a girl is physically, naturally indicative that she can produce children, she gets married. That's yes. how that society runs. So the marriage of Aisha was at an age that was perfectly acceptable for the society of that time. Whether she was nine at the time when they actually consummated or older, as her older sister, some of the narrations mention, doesn't really matter. What mm. matters is that she was of the right age for marriage for that society. We have in America many presidents that got married to girls that were underage according to our standard of 18 today. Yes. We have uh, Elvis Presley, Elvis married, Presley. a younger yeah. girl. You have, I mean, if you go to Europe, all your kings, right? Yeah. And since we're on the subject, you know, how old was Rebecca according to biblical references when she got married in the Bible? Three. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm just saying that if David Wood or any of the Islamophobes want to be just and honest about it, well, according to majority <laughs> of the biblical scholars, Mary was about 12 when she got married. They might come back, oh, no, 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 Mary's age is not in the Bible. Well, Aisha's age is not in the Quran. Right. Right? Fair enough. But yes. if you go to any historical references like the Catholic uh, Encyclopedia and others, they will mention that she was around 12 to 14 years of age. 
And Joseph, according to those references, was around 90 at mm. the time. And, yeah. you know, they had sexual intercourse afterwards, uh, as most references will mention. And, you know, she was married to him at that age. Now, today, that would not be acceptable. But then people say, oh, no, 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 at that society, that's when Jewish girls would get married. Okay, mm -hmm. well, then Arabian society, that's when Arabian girls would get married. Right, right. Yeah, I just want to point out the hypocrisy again here in the West. If you look into what teenagers do, everybody knows it. It's an open book. When they hit right. puberty, they go out partying, they have promiscuous sex, right. teen pregnancy, etc., etc. So this is nature. This is God showing you that the bodies are fully functioning. Yeah. And instead of using it productively, like your grandparents in that case, they use it absolutely in the wrong way. And end up, yeah, never married, single mom households, whatever, right? There's so a there's a that? school in San Diego. Uh, I used to be a teacher's assistant when I was going to college in that school, mm. and they have a daycare for the girls, and it's a middle school, right? Okay. That means sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was a twelve year old girl uh, that had a child yeah. in that school. Now imagine that means she was sexually active at eleven or under, right? Yeah. And nobody considers that to be an uh, illegal act here in America today, right? Mm -hmm. She did it. She's not in yep. jail. Her boyfriend that she had the child with is not in jail, right? Right. If that is okay for people to have sex at that age, then why wouldn't they get married at that age? If they're ready for it, right? Absolutely. In Islam, we have books of fiqh jurisprudence. And what those books like al mughni and Al-Majmu'ah, they tell us, is marriage has to do with physical readiness and mental capability of a person. Meaning mm -hmm. if you're in a society where through menstrual cycles or whatever else, you are ready. And that's not the only thing. There are other indicators that can be taken for sexual intercourse. And you want to get married at that age. We cannot say, no, you cannot. Right? Because if you don't, have, like some societies, the average lifespan is around 30 years of age. Mm -hmm. And even till today, it's interestingly, uh, and if that is true and you tell somebody you have to wait to be 21 to get married, and you know, to study first. Like, who, who's going <laughs> to raise the kids, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's going to like, by the time you're 10, your parents are dead. Um, right. right. And in yeah. earlier societies, you had certain things like that as well. Sure. So, um, you know, in accordance to the society of that sign, and this is why none of the polytheists, none of the Jews or Christians or atheists or anybody else in that society ever objected to that marriage. Because that was mm -hmm. the norm of society. Makes sense. Okay, let's move on to the next one. This concerns the prophethood itself or the revelation itself. It's a two-part question. So Angel Gabriel never revealed himself as Gabriel, according to my knowledge. And his wife told him that he is the prophet to Muhammad, even though Muhammad was scared of his experience. So, for example, in the Bible, from what we've seen is that the angel Gabriel actually introduces himself to Mary, but it's not the same interface, not the same respondents sure. with Prophet Mormon. Yeah. So, so that's actually incorrect. Uh, the angel okay. Gabriel did uh, introduce himself as the angel, um, not once, but repeatedly. And you will find in the Quran uh, references to when uh, the angel Gabriel showed his actual form to the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, at the first incident, he was in shock, as, as anybody else would be, um, you know, having given that huge responsibility at the f age of 40. So when he went to his wife, she comforted him and she told him that you are an honest man and Allah would not allow somebody as good as you, who is uh, somebody who keeps the trust, who's always been honest, never lied, to be misguided. She comforted him. But the angel Gabriel came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, in many forms, repeatedly through his life, introducing himself. So this is one of those Islamophobic lies, because mm -hmm. even in the Hadith in Al-Bukhari, he came and the companions saw him. And he came uh, at that time in the form of a man. And he sat with the Prophet ﷺ, and he asked him questions. The Prophet ﷺ told the companion, this is the angel Gabriel. And many times in authentic narrations, he came and he asked permission to enter the house. And he mm -hmm. came and saw him. And sometimes in his actual form, which covers the sky, sometimes in a, a in angelic form, but less than that, and sometimes mm -hmm. in human form, when the companions even saw that he was somebody 
that had no traces of travel and he had very clean clothes and he was not from Medina. So they were shocked. And the Prophet mm-hmm. told him, this is Jibreel and he's come to teach you the religion by asking questions. It's a very famous hadith, authentic hadith in Al-Bukhari, uh, where the five pillars of, uh, of Islam and six pillars of Iman are mentioned in that hadith and so on. So, so no, he, he definitely did introduce himself repeatedly, and there is okay. no doubt to that prophethood. Very good to know. This is something that I didn't know. I learned something. So after this questioning, we are pretty much through with those questions. I just want to hear it from you as a sheikh, how you would describe Prophet Muhammad, his character, his actions. He's been called the Excellent. perfect example. How would you describe him? The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was human. We don't worship him. We don't consider him to be God. Uh, but no doubt in my mind at all that amongst humanity, he was the best of them. Um, other prophets were also excellent. We don't, we, don't, we don't try to put down any prophet. Jesus was an amazing person. Moses was an amazing person. Abraham was an amazing person. Peace and blessings be on all of them. That's one thing beautiful about Islam. We love all the prophets. We love, we respect all of them. Uh, we take all of them to be equally a part of our belief. Meaning if I deny as a Muslim, David or Moses or Jesus or Abraham, peace and blessings be upon them, I'm no longer a Muslim. That's a part of our belief. Right? The prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lived in a time where he showed us everything. Meaning uh, like Jesus, for example, he was never in a time where he had to lead a state. Or he had to defend uh, against a war or get married and deal with children, right? His lifespan, uh, uh, and again, as Muslims, we don't believe that he's finished, that he's, he's not dead. He was raised to Allah and he will come back. But his life in this worldly life, as, as was here until he was taken up to Allah, was very short. So we don't see a lot of these things, right? But the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 63 years was, was his life when he passed away from this worldly life. So that tells you that all of those states were known. And if we look at, and again, like I said, I have a series on the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. It's on the One Message Foundation channel, and it's also on the Majribad channel. Mm-hmm. We have the beginning all talking about him as a person and what is authentic, Sahih Hadith. Anas ibn Malik, one of the uh, young companions who was there as a servant, not a slave, but he was there to serve the Prophet, peace be upon him. He said, I served him and he never got upset. He never told me, oof, even, which is the lightest word of displeasure. He never told me, why didn't you do this? Why did you do this? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, never hit a wife. He never hit his children. He was such a beautiful character. I mean, in a, in a, there's a hadith where he, playing with his wife Aisha, he pokes her chest a little bit. And they're like, oh, he abused his wife. Aisha Radian herself said the Prophet never hit. I mean, this is his companionship is he used to joke with his wives he used to race with them and and they would win the race sometimes and he would win because he would have that loving relationship he had an example of tolerance that i cannot imagine you know people slandered him people hit him with rocks blood would flow from his head and fill his shoes and he had the ability that he could destroy those people but he forgave them the people of taif in mecca when he was victorious, when Allah gave him victory in Mecca, he didn't say, you, I remember you said bad to me, I'm going to kill you. No. Other than people that had committed war crimes and things, he came in with being humble, his beard touching his camel. He was, he was lowered that much. And he came in a way of forgiveness. He said, whoever goes in this house, they're forgiven. Whoever goes to the Kaaba, he's forgiven. Whoever goes here, they're forgiven. Like, like imagine that. Somebody kicks you out of your house. Uh, kills your companions, causes the death of your wife through the hardship that Khatija went through, caused the death of, of Abu Talib, his, your uncle, to the hardships, killed your mm-hmm. uncle Hamza, and you forgive them. Look at that beautiful example. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he showed us how to be a leader of a state. He showed us how to lead a war, how to defend a people. Uh, he showed us all those things because those are things we go through. Humans have wars. Uh, in, if we yeah. say, okay, you know, this is the Islam doesn't believe in hypocrisy, right? Mm. Christians will say we turn the other cheek. But you know, that's hypocrisy. I challenge any Christian, come to me, let me slap you a good bam, let me hit you hard, <laughs> and let me see you turn the other cheek, right? So it's hypocrisy. You're saying something you right. don't do. 
turn the other cheek. Why does every Christian country have an army? Why do yeah. we have police? Why do we have uh, U.S. invading Iraq? Why do we have the, the? Why did we have crusades? Why did we have crusaders with swords and and spears and 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 where is the pacifism? This is is mm. hypocrisy, right? In Islam, we don't believe in hypocrisy. Yes, there's the time to defend you. You don't do dhulm. You don't do oppression. You don't. We don't believe in terrorism. We don't believe in killing innocent people. But there is a time. If you're going to kill me, I'm going to defend myself. That's a true Fair religion. Yeah. Yes. So I see the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to be a perfect example in all those situations, right? Uh, it's not a, his life is better documented than any other historical figure. Everything from what he ate and how he slept and what he did when he first woke up and may Allah reward Aisha, anha, the wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that she is the one that really, uh, one of the greatest narrators of hadith, because of her, we know a lot of those personal details, everything about him, and with that scrutiny to have that great character that Michael Hart, a non-Muslim who wrote 100 most influential people in the world, put him as number one, shows you what a great amazing person he was. Peace and blessings be upon him. Beautiful. My personal question about this is, because he is seen by yourself as well as this perfect role model, as Muslims, should you or shouldn't you distinguish between the prophets? Should there be an exalted position for Muhammad? Like when you become a Muslim, do you see Muhammad as higher slightly or are they all the same prophets of God? So, so there is three aspects to that. One is our belief. We believe mm -hmm. in all of them equally, meaning that a part of the Islamic belief is to believe in all of the prophets. We can't reject any of them. Okay? Mm -hmm. Second is a love and respect we have for all of them. Meaning the Prophet Peter himself said, don't praise me over you, uh, Yunus. Like, don't say, oh, he's better than Yunus. And another right. hadith, he said, don't praise me over Musa. So don't mm -hmm. compare between prophets, say this one is better than this one. We don't do that. But we and do don't know that do, he is... So, sorry to interrupt. And don't do okay. what the Christians have done to Jesus, right? Exactly. Don't over-exaggerate my status mm -hmm. or start praying to me or through me and all this stuff that right. some Muslims do do, which is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we do know that he was the Sayyid of Ibn Adam. Yani he is the leader of all of the children of Adam on the Day of Judgment. He is the one that will do the intercession for all of mankind. And we know he's the last of all prophets. So he has that status. We don't deny that status, that he mm -hmm. is the one that led all of the prophets in prayer, for example. Right, but we don't sit around saying, "Oh, he's better than this prophet." We we don't do that, right? We okay. love him, and we love all the prophets. Peace and blessings be upon all of them. Beautiful. Okay, next short burst question. This is of extremely big interest to me personally because I do love dogs. I do love drawing pictures as well. So why are those <laughs> things har haram? We have music. Excellent question. We have dogs, we have chess, even pictures and drawing sure. animated beings. And I love chess too. That's true. I will go through I will go through all those with you. Right, uh, cool. But first thing I will say is the most important thing is the belief. Right? So when we're talking about Islam and Kufr and all of that, the most important thing you need to think to yourself is do I believe there is one great creator that created everything that is the one sole power of the universe that runs everything, that is the Shahada, that nothing else should be worshipped except him? And do I believe that he sent prophets, that he sent those messengers, the first of them being Adam and the last being Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon them. This is the core of Islam that you have to first believe, accept, reject, right? Mm -hmm. Then we get into particular rulings and madahib and fiqh, these are what we call the nitty gritties of it, right? Yeah. If you haven't gone through that first, I wouldn't really go worry about, I, I will explain them today anyway, but I'm just saying that we shouldn't let any of that render us because Allah, if we believe there is a creator, we believe there is Allah, then Allah knows better than me whether I should drink or not drink or eat pork or not eat pork. Then if Allah right. says haram, it's haram. Now, uh, regarding dogs, we as Muslims love dogs. There's nothing against dogs. There is the mention of, of the kalb, the dog of Ashab al-Kahf, the people of the cave in the Quran, and he's praised, uh, and so on. 
um, uh, there were companions that owned togs for hunting and they asked the rulings of those. And we have nothing against that. So if somebody has a dog for a purpose, whether it is for shepherding or uh, guarding or hunting, and from an extension of that uh, emotional support or CI dogs uh, in Islam, that is permissible, right? When there is a purpose. Oh. When people have dogs without purpose and they use them in a way that is against the nature of the dog, then mm -hmm. in Islam, that's not allowed. Meaning, you know, a dog has a nature to it, right? Like yeah. some dogs are naturally good shepherds. Some are naturally good guard dogs. When you take that and you put little bows on them and you put them around little kids and you act as if it's like a mouse, it's not. And that's mm -hmm. why you have every year so many children that are killed by their own dogs, masters that are bit and so on, because yeah. they're taking something Allah made with a certain role and giving it a different role, right? Mm -hmm. And that's wrong. It, it's oppression to the dog. If you have a dog for shepherding, like I said, or if you have a dog for hunting, or if you have a dog to protect your house, or if you have a dog because it helps you get around as a seeing eye dog or any of those things, that's halal, that's fine, no problem with that. But, you know, don't take a dog and uh, kiss it on the mouth and act like... I Make it like, your baby. Make, Make it, it your, your baby. baby, yeah. I, exactly. I see a lot so, of that in the West. Before you proceed, I just want to clarify quickly why I'm so interested in those little nitty gritties, the details, because the thing is, I'm completely honest here with you and transparent. I always conduct myself like that on YouTube as well. I treat my Good. subscribers as friends. The point is that I always dive into everything I do deeply. Good. So I will Good. find out about everything, even if I would take Shahada, I would make research my mission on a daily basis. I would have to Excellent. go further and further. further. And this is why those little things <clears throat> that are now on my way, I have to discuss them prior. before taking No it problem. Away. I will explain all those things. The reason I was saying is because sometimes what happens is shaitan gets you to procrastinate. And this is one of the tricks of sure. the devil that we know, you know. So if you have the belief, you shouldn't procrastinate. But any question you have, I'm here for you until oh. we do your shahad. And then after that as well. Thank you very much. Okay, All next right. one after dogs. Uh, let's go with music. Why is Excellent. music haram? Even though if I look at pop culture, I could already assume why it is haram. But Excellent. I would like an explanation. So in Islam, we have certain forms of music that's halal, right? Mm -hmm. One of them being the uh, what we call spoken word, meaning poetry and beautiful wording that comes out. Nothing wrong with that. Some of the greatest scholars of Islam, like a Shafi'i and others, were great poets. Some of the companions mm -hmm. of the Prophet, peace be upon him, like Hassan ibn Thabit was a great poet. The Prophet was not a poet, peace be upon him, because Allah chose somebody that wasn't a poet, that wasn't literate to reveal the Quran, to show is a miraculous book. He didn't write it. But there mm -hmm. were later people who became Muslim, like Hassan ibn Thabit, anhu, who was a great poet. So nothing wrong with that. There is an instrument called the Duff, and that mm -hmm. is permissible in certain situations. And there are hadith on that, and there is references to that. So that is also permissible. Now when we go with general music, it has, a, a, scientifically, we have researched this issue, it has an effect on people, meaning your mood, your, like you said about hip hop or even heavy metal culture. Um, mm. I have seen a mosh pit. I don't know if you know what a mosh pit is. Yeah. Um, okay. I have mm. seen people that I knew in high school that were very timid, gentle, good people, and when they were in that mosh pit and the music was blurring and the wording was such, they were punching people, they were kicking, <laughs> they were, and I was shocked at how different they became, became mm. because of that. Um, I don't know if you know Marvin Gaye is, but we used yeah, to true. call that baby making music because it would mm. have an effect on people of course. that would lead them to certain things. So in his, Islam, his father, sorry to interrupt again, his right. father allegedly killed Marvin because he was a believing Christian and he thought that his music is not permissible. So that is the conspiracy behind that. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, I learned yeah. something from you. Um, mm. so, so this is why music generally is not allowed in Islam because it has an effect on people that can take them to decisions that would regularly not be good for them, right? Not that this happens every time, right? But Islam is a religion that looks at the general good for mankind, right? So there are certain things that were left permissible 
to give you that leeway, like the duff in certain situations and poetry and, and spoken word and those things, that's fine. But other situations were then for, forbidden, like guitars and things like that, because then it's very hard to draw the line, right? Where do you stop somebody from saying, okay, this is now becoming into something that's making you, uh, you know, into a satanic, uh, weird mindset. Like, you know, very recently, there was a rap concert in the U.S. I forgot the mm -hmm. name of the rapper. Um, but, you know, there was <sighs> such a frenzy made that people were yeah. stomping on other people and he continued the music. You know, the, right. it, it, it's there's you have to kind of step away from your own personal desires to see the bigger picture. I mean, I sure. can tell you, I come from a background where I was involved in gangs. And many times when we were about to do something violent or a fight, we would put on a rap song that had some mm -hmm. really violent, because it would get you pumped up for it. You know? Get you pumped up, so, yes. Yeah, so, so this is why that is something forbidden in Islam, but there are permissible forms. And again, if a Muslim does listen to music, it doesn't make him a kafir, it doesn't make him not Muslim. Everybody has their shortcomings. Some people... They may become Muslim and they still listen to music and then slowly, slowly they replace that with the Quran and things that are more beneficial and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting answer. How about chess? I don't find anything Excellent. negative in chess. Actually, during this whole pandemic, I started mm -hmm. playing chess a lot and I thought it, it is a great benefit to me personally. Right. Regarding chess, there is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. Um, some of the scholars of Islam, like Imam Shafi'i, he understood it to not reference the game itself, but rather the waste of time that comes with it. Um, yeah, other definitely. scholars like Imam Ahmad and Malik, they took it. Uh, but the thing is, in Islam, you have to be careful when anything kind of distracts you so much that it takes you away from the purpose of your life. Like mm -hmm. I have seen people, uh, including some relatives of mine, that play chess for hours and hours a day until they start missing prayers, until they start, uh, you know, missing, uh, and, and not just chess. I mean, many other video games. I mean, you can take right, anything, right, right. TikTok videos, whatever. So yeah. in essence, the issue is that when those sorts of things start taking you away from your obligations, then it becomes a distraction to the purpose of your life. Um, like I said, regarding chess, there's a difference of opinions among scholars of Islam about the game itself. Imam mm -hmm. Shafi'i, one of the very early and amazing scholars, he considered the game itself to be permissible and the hadith to be more in reference to the general games that waste time and take you away from your obligations than anything else. Yeah, that makes absolute perfect sense again, especially if you project yeah. that onto modern day games such as video games. I mean, obviously, yeah. we don't even have to talk about how that is one of the greatest distractions we I have mean, nowadays. There are kids that play 12 to 14 hours a day. Yeah. I'm not talking about an extreme case. You know, in mm -hmm. Japan, in well, China, there's actually, uh, they have actual mental health facilities to get kids off of games and things. So, so of course. And again, if you were to play some games uh, in moderation, and uh, other than like dice games or games that have gambling, not yeah, those, yeah, yeah. but like other things, no. nothing wrong with that. But when anything gets to be where it starts to distract you from the purpose of your life, that's problematic. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think it was in Japan that a player of World of Warcraft, he didn't move for a few days, and that's how they realized that he died alone in his apartment, in his wow. little cubicle. Yeah. That's he scary. He just died because of dehydration. He just kept on playing. Yeah, that's scary. Okay, next one is pictures or slash drawing animated beings. So regarding drawings, uh, to draw scenery or to mountains or things like this, nothing wrong with that. When you draw things that have a soul, if you draw it complete, this is something Islam forbids because of the fact that it does lead to things. Not that it by itself is worshipping an idol, but it mm. could lead to it. And we know in the past, uh, like the calm of uh, Nuh, Noah, those things like building, making pictures led them after generations, but it led them to worshipping idols. So mm -hmm. we don't allow that. But if you are an artist, you can make pictures, but you leave some things like either you uh, leave part of the body undone or you don't make a full picture or as many Muslim uh, artists that will do, they'll, they won't make the eyes or they'll leave like something, some imperfection in there. So it doesn't start to lead to being something that would take you towards uh, idol worship or something like this. 
Uh, and again, if there's a benefit to the drawings, like Ibn Qudama, one of the great scholars in Al-Mughni, says that if it's to teach people, for example, then it's permissible. So uh, you could draw, but you will have some uh, restrictions in the sense that you don't make it so perfect as if you're trying to imitate the creation or you're trying to make it where you want it to be something that draws your attention so much that you now want to hang it, look at it, and maybe your kids will come and start looking at it and go, you know, maybe that was some amazing being or something like this, you know? So mm -hmm. you have to, Islam believes in prevention instead of cure. So you can still draw within those uh, constraints, inshallah. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. This really clarified a lot for me personally, because oh, I just good. saw this black and white world where now there are oh. no pictures anymore. There is no sound no, to be no. heard. I, I mean, like I said, I mean, walk a dog. No, no, we, we have, uh, I mean, if you go to Muslim countries, like I have an uncle, he's a hunter. He's, he has many great dogs. Uh, right. My family in the village, they all have dogs because they have farms. Right. Um, you know, I have friends in San Diego that are very good practicing Muslims that have dogs for a legitimate mm -hmm. reason. And, you know, we yes. have certain rules and regulations with them. There are Muslim artists that are well known throughout the world, um, you know, in all kinds of art. And obviously the nasheed, the Islamic songs within the boundaries of nasheed are beautiful. They're used. Uh, I mean, we, we hear them in all Muslim countries, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Now we come to the Christian questions, the last remaining Christian questions. If Jesus is not the son of God, mm -hmm. who is the father? He was born of Mary Excellent. and God impregnated her, so to speak, through the Holy Spirit, according to Christianity. So who is the father? Excellent question. Uh, Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, was a prophet and he was born miraculously without a father. He doesn't have a father. And that's not something strange. If you look in the Bible, you will find Adam didn't have a father. You will find Eve didn't have a father or mother doesn't mean God is their biological father. You will find people referenced as children of God, like Solomon as the son of God, Israel as the son of God in the Bible. Uh, it is a term of endearment used for them. So we say that Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, has no father. God is not the physical father of anybody. God orders, and, and we are, right? In a term of endearment, Maybe in Aramaic, you could call God the Father in the sense of endearment. Maybe. I don't know Aramaic well enough to say that. But mm -hmm. no doubt that physically God is not the father of anybody. He is above needing children or a wife or a mother or dad or any of that kind of thing. Um, as Adam and Eve had no father and no mother, and they were miraculously born by the order of God. Jesus was miraculously born without a father by the order of God. So the differentiation is essentially being created and not yes. being made by the Father or yeah, exactly. biologically all, created. All, all of us were created by God's order. Before we were right. in the wombs of our mothers, we were souls, right? Allah ordained in this world that we have a father and mother. But if Allah orders it like Adam and Eve, you're born without a father and mother. As Jesus was, peace and blessings be upon all of them. Speaking about Adam and Eve, this is something again, of particular interest to me personally, the Christian narrative of Adam and Eve, mm. Eve essentially convicts basically Adam to sinning. She brings him to sin. She listens to the devil, to the snake, mm -hmm. and Adam starts listening to her. This story is actually very dear to me because I've seen it in my personal life. So this is going to sound very misogynistic. But mm -hmm. at the same time, every time we as men, we start listening to women rather than to God, so to speak, rather than <laughs> to... You understand to ourselves, right? Sure. And then to God, we kind of get off stray. I'm sure that plenty of men have experienced that, and if not, then I would even make the argument that then you haven't listened closely and haven't observed closely what is going on within your life, and even within Islam. Obviously, we have a male and female structure. The man of is, course. I believe, the leading person. So that this is true. why this this story of origin made so much sense to me. That instead of listening to God, Adam listened to the woman. But in Islam, it's a bit different. In Islam, it's different. Islam, we don't actually blame Eve for it. Rather, we say they both were tempted by the devil and they listened to the devil um, mm -hmm. instead of listening to God. Uh, we, we, we based our narration on authentic sources and so on. We don't go with uh, biblical sources because they have so much of the changes in it and so on. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Having said that, um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, did warn us that one of the first things that destroyed the earlier nations like Ben Israel was the fitna, the, the trials and revolutions that came through women and a lot of the jealousies and, and misinformation they gave to husbands and so on. And this is something that we should be very careful about. Um, mm-hmm. Women are, uh, in many ways, very intelligent, very capable. In many ways, there are certain things that they have weaknesses. And, and men have their own uh, strong points and weaknesses. Everybody has their role. In Islam, the man is the leader. He is the decision maker. Yes, he can consult his wife and his children, but he is the head of the household. He's responsible yeah. for the household, and he needs to make those decisions. And those decisions are the final decisions in a household. All right. Yeah, so in Islam, that is no different, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I just simply like the analogy because it made so much sense to me that Adam actually listened to the woman and not to God. Uh, this is how he went right. off stray. Anyways, another question for me, and this is really important for me to understand, is you mentioned the Injil at the beginning of our talk. Sure. We don't really know what the Injil is because we don't really have it now, right? The question that I'm having is, out of an Islamic perspective, Jesus preaches monotheism, but he's preaching yeah. that in the land of the Jews, right? So they are already monotheistic. Sure. They already worship one God. So what is the Injil? What could it have been? What did he really preach in those lands? Excellent. Um, Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, he preached monotheism as every prophet preached monotheism. The Jews were mm-hmm. monotheistic, but there were many sects amongst Jews that worshipped idols. They worshipped the golden calf, for example. They worshipped wealth in many ways. They corrupted the law in many ways. They charged, as we know historically, they charged people to go in the church or in the synagogue or in the place mm-hmm. of worship in the temple, which was wrong. So he came to rectify the law. He came to correct the law. And that's what many prophets did before him. Even Moses preached monotheism to Jews who were monotheistic, but they had gone astray. So he came to correct the people and to bring them back on track. The Injil is the revelation that was given to the prophet Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him. Aspects of it may be in the New Testament today, meaning certain teachings from it may have come down in those traditions, but we know the New Testament as it is today was written in Koine Greek, as you mentioned, and was written mm-hmm. centuries later. So it is not the Injil itself, but some aspects of those teachings could be there. How do we know what's right from wrong? We evaluate with the Quran. Okay. All right. Plenty of questions that are written down. You already answered whilst speaking about it. So I want to jump to my last chapter of questioning, so to speak. Questions about reverting. And I think this is the most important part, obviously. Excellent. If if I would revert, would I need to circumcise, first and foremost? Great question. Um, Regarding circumcision for men, it's a part of the tradition that has been there from the time of the earlier prophets and in Islam. Um, and the general rule is that if somebody does revert, yes, they go and get circumcised. But uh, we also know that due to age and time and place, that may not be possible for everybody, right? Um, so we would have to look at the situation, whether you are capable, whether there is a medical facility or ability to do it safely in a, a way that wouldn't harm your health, then mm. yes, if that is not the case, then you are not held accountable for something that's out of your capability. You don't just, you know, for... Uh, this is a beautiful thing at Islam. Allah never burdens a soul more than they can handle. If you are capable and able and there is a there is a way, then yes, you would. And if there isn't, due to you know, you're being of older age and not having the medical facilities or that around you, then we don't worry about that. I mean, Allah doesn't burden you more than somebody can handle. So that's not an issue. I'm not 20 anymore, so I'm a bit older. I'm 35 already. And <laughs> yeah, now I'm a family circum- father. Circumcision is like my... usually a, when you're very young. I mean, if you're past 10, uh, that, that that just becomes a problem later. So. Yeah, but that's my question yeah. as well. So for me, as the head of the household, right? I'm a father now. My son is almost one and a half years old. If I would Excellent. revert, what would I have to do with my son? I would have to bring him to circumcision, right? I mean, so if your son is young enough that you can get him circumcised, then you should. I mean, there are also great health benefits to it. I mean, from the cleansing aspect of it and so on. Um, But again, depending on your country and depending on resources, like in America, uh, for a child that's past six months, 
it's very difficult to find a place that they can get circumcised. So a lot of the brothers that revert, if their children are one or two or three or 10 or 12, um, it's just not possible for them or it's very expensive. So we don't push the issue because Allah doesn't burden them more than they can handle. Um, but if in the country you're at, you can find a medical facility that will that will take care of it in a way that's safe and sanitary, then definitely you should. Right on. Another question that I have, and this is especially important for me personally, because coming from an orthodox Christian background, right, this is already a sect, so to speak, of Christianity, even though orthodoxy would claim that it is the original Christianity, of course, but then you look deeper sure. into it. Maybe right. it was the Gnostic Christians, maybe it was Arius, etc., etc. We yeah. don't know that. I got very fed up with sects, looking into Catholicism, Protestantism. Good. It was annoying. So when I read the Quran and it claimed this is for the believers, right? This is for the Muslims. Yeah. And you shouldn't divide into sects. I said, oh, thank God. This is beautiful. Yeah. This is exactly what I want. I don't want to belong to any type of sect. But then you Good. look deeper into it and then you see Sunni, Shia, et cetera, et cetera, different schools of thought. Could I become just a Muslim and not a Shia, yes. Sunni, whatever? For sure. And that's what I suggest is you just become Muslim. Um, we as Muslims, the vast majority of Muslims are not in any sect. They're just Muslim. Sometimes we're called Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah because the Prophet ﷺ said, said alaykum bi sunnati upon you is a sunnah to be a, on the way of the Prophet. And a, a Jama'ah means actually to come together as one group, not to separate, right? Mm -hmm. Shia is a sect. Uh, Ismaili, Qadiani, uh, Nation, all these little groups, these are sects that break away. And that's wrong. We, we give them advice to don't break away from the bigger Muslim body that is one Muslim body. But if, and inshallah, when you do today, become a Muslim, you will be just Muslim. That's all you got to worry about. Yes, we have schools of thought. That is not sect. Those are just different ways of deriving uh, rulings. And all of those are in agreement. All those four great scholars were in one belief. They were all, yani, they, weren't, they didn't separate themselves in belief. Is this, you know, when we get into some details of, you know, should you put your hand here or here and you look at the different narrations, like those things, it's a scholarly work, right? But they're not sects. Um, mm -hmm. Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, these are schools, they're not sects. The bigger sects that we do have, unfortunately, these are people that have split away from the majority Muslim body. We would say to you, don't worry about any of those. You are Muslim and that's all the title you need. Fair enough. That's really good to hear because, yeah, coming from the Christian background, it is yes, extremely sure. annoying. So now I have a question. This is something that I heard from Sheikh Asim Al-Hakim. And he was speaking about the Muslim <clears throat> Ummah, that it's very weak at this stage. And that once it becomes strong, there could be an expensive jihad, extensive jihad. So this is something that I'm paraphrasing here, but we were speaking about sure. yeah, expansionist wars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So my question is truly, and I really mean this: yeah. What am I signing up for, right? If I become Muslim, <laughs> no, really, honestly, I'm, I, I'm, I got you, I got you, no problem. I'm completely, I'm completely uh, transparent here. If no, I sign up, wonderful. is it is it my personal belief, or do I sign up? Hey, now we are strong enough. We have plenty of people on board. Let's conquer the world. Let's go to war. What is happening? <laughs> Great question. Uh, regarding uh, Sheikh Asim's statement, I, I won't comment because I don't know the context. I don't right. know the exact wording. But generally, what I will say, in Islam, we don't have a mindset of just conquer. Right? That's not something ever in Islam. If you look at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, he made treaties. He made peace treaties. He made uh, alliances. If you look at the companions of the Prophet, like Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, radiallahu anhum, in their times, they had different treaties they made with different nations and so on. Uh, but at the same time, when somebody attacks a Muslim land, then yes, to defend it is a part of our responsibility. Um, sure. If Muslims, like in Spain, if you look at the history, are being tortured and killed, then yes, to defend them. And even non-Muslims, to stop the oppression upon them is our responsibility. But mm -hmm. the Muslim is never about just conquering and fighting. This has never been the case. This is not in, in uh, the Quran or Hadith. Rather, what we find is that even the Muslim armies, when they would go out in the time of the companions, they would give options. They would say, look, either allow us to spread the message. Let us get this message out. 
And if you're going to stop us, you know, then there's going to be a problem. If you want, you keep your government, you keep your kingdom, you become Muslim, you stay in power, but you change the 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 your belief set and system to what Allah has ordained, mm. not to force the people. If you don't want to do that, don't don't become Muslim. We're not going to force people. Pay the jizya. You know, you have your tax, which as Muslims we pay zakat. You will have your jizya. That's how the government runs. Just like you pay taxes in America or in the UK or in Europe, you yeah, everybody yeah. has different taxes and different brackets and all of that. I, r I rather uh, pay the jizya than the taxes. Oh, uh, Europe, trust me. To be honest, you know, even if even <laughs> if you look at jizya and zakat, many times depending on the how much wealth you have, zakat will be more. As mm -hmm. a Muslim, why do we have jizya? Why don't we make non-Muslims pay our tax system? Like I live in America, I pay tax. I don't say, hey, I'm Muslim, I'm not going to pay taxes. No, this is this is our system. Right. But as Muslims, zakat is a, a religious obligation. If we mm -hmm. were to force a religious obligation on, uh, on another religion, then we would be forcing our religious our religion on them. So right. for them to live in the Muslim land and not pay zakat and use all the facilities would not be fair. So to put them, uh, okay, you have your place, you're, you're here, you're enjoying the services, but that doesn't mean that you're going to take advantage of it. You have to pay into the system as well. If a non-Muslim is not benefiting from those services, there's no jizya. Like in America, we have non-Muslims. We don't tell them pay jizya. Why? Because we don't have those services. Khair. So the point being that uh, you're not signing up to join any army. There's no khalifa. There is right now, I mean, unfortunately, in the time that we have, we're pretty much... This scattered everywhere. It's really a belief system. If we get a united Muslim body and everything in your lifetime and everything, it doesn't mean we're just going to be like marching into countries. No, there has to be reasons. There has to be negotiations. There has to be treaties. There has to be sabab for what we do, right? If somebody is stopping people from entering the paradise and stopping the message, then yes, we as if we have that power, we give them that notice. Look, you can't. You ha people have to be able to recognize their creator, right? If people are oppressing a people, oppressing Muslims, then yes, we defend them. But unfortunately, right now, that's not even a factor because of the state that we're in. Um, even when the Muslims had power, if you look at historically, in the time of Salahuddin Ayyubi, they didn't just go and attack uh, Spain and Russia and stuff like this. No, mm. even in Jerusalem, and you can look at history, they allowed Christians to have their churches. They allowed Jews to have their synagogues. They allowed them to even practice their own personal law in accordance yes. with their religious tradition, a, a freedom that I don't have in America. In America, mm -hmm. I cannot say I'm going to, uh, as a Mormon or as a Muslim, uh, I'm going to marry a second wife legally. You cannot, even though that's in the Mormon tradition. It's in the Muslim tradition. It's in many other religious traditions, but they cannot. Right? They're not given that right. But under Islam, non-Muslims would be given that right to have their personal family law by their tradition, right? Yes. Yeah, that's actually and, correct. I looked into the Ottoman Empire, obviously, coming yeah. from the Balkans, and it's true. Otherwise, we wouldn't have all of those old churches still right. intact. I mean, think of this. What, what did the Spanish do at the Inquisition? When they mm. took Spain from the Moors, they massacred all the Muslims and all Jews and other Christians that didn't fit their mindset. They genocided them, right? True. If the Muslims had done that in Spain, you wouldn't have any of that if the Muslims, if the Ottomans had done that, if if Salahuddin Ayyubi had done that. So as Muslims, we're not just looking at taking over lands or you know trying to enforce. That's not the way Islam works. It's never worked like that. Alhamdulillah. Fair enough. My last question is simply: How would applied Sharia ideally look like? Because right now, I don't think we have many countries, if at all, that follow proper Sharia. How would that look like in an ideal world for you? Excellent, excellent. Um, when we look at historically, um, like the times of the Khulafa, the uh, the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, and the time of the Prophet himself, peace and blessings be upon him, and later like Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and those that applied the Sharia correctly, we saw a beautiful society, a society where Christians and Jews can live according to their own traditions if they like, and they can be productive members of the society, a society where you have uh, safety, even in the countries that have some Sharia law, like Saudi Arabia and others, you will find mm -hmm. much more uh, of a safe society for your wife, for your children, as a father, yeah. uh, uh, as, uh, as the leader of a household. You'll feel comfortable 
in those societies more than societies where you have uh you know robberies and carjackings and you know i was recently in london and you look at the stabbings you, you go to la you go to i was in tijuana you look at the murders mm. you wouldn't have that under sharia under mm. sharia you have see it's not pre, it's not cure it's prevention oh, so right. let me ask you a very simple question and and i'm i'm blunt like i'm straight about sure. it like i'm a sure, muslim sure. you know if you knew that you could rob somebody and let's mm. say in norway or sweden or one of those countries mm-hmm. and you might if you get caught you might go to a jail where you have a tv and you have a workout <laughs> bike uh, i mean we see videos i mean i haven't been to a prison there but this is what we see yeah you might take that chance you know if you're right. you might take that chance but if you know that if you go and rip a woman's purse and take her stuff and even though you're not starving you're not in any kind of need you're mentally mm. fine you're going to get your hand chopped off you're going to be walking on like this yeah you're you're, you're going to be overly honest because you don't want to take that chance now in the sharia we have checks and balances we check mental health we check with person who's in need person who's under age is not going to be punished you have those checks and balances crimes have to be proven but the punishment is such that it prevents the crime in america we have a huge problem with prisons and prison gangs and people going to jail because yeah, the setup is wrong right everybody's like ah oh, if i get locked up so what there's this and then you get locked up and then some guys trying to rape you and then you got to stab somebody and then it just ru- the whole system and you don't rehabilitate you sit in prison mm. for 10 years get stronger and build a cl- criminal network and come out and be a better criminal that's why the the rates of people going back to jail are sometimes uh, in the upper 90s that's insane mm. what are we doing in the sharia we don't have a jail system we only we don't have a prison system we have a jail system you arrest uh. somebody you check if it's proven if they get lashes if they get whipped or they nothing if they're innocent whatever you're done you go back to being a productive citizen and you remember those lashes you're like man i'm not going to do that again you know mm. right i didn't know that that's very interesting i didn't know yeah. that there would be a prison system at we all we don't have a prison system yeah we have oh. a jail system that you arrest uh, mm. before the case can go right but what's the point of putting somebody in prison for 20 years uh, yeah. what does society Nothing. benefit your taxes pay 70 80,000 a year to keep somebody in a hole that you know mentally being tortured no benefit in that right. and in islam like in muslim countries where there's some aspects of sharia look statistically look at the rape rates look at the uh, the, the crime rates look at the mm-hmm. murder rates they're the lowest in the world so society with practical implication of sharia your wife could walk around without being worried your your children could play in the playground without drug dealers and all of that you wouldn't yeah, have man. to worry about uh, you know people robbing you people ripping you off motorbikes and doing all the things that we see you wouldn't have any of those kids. and and i can tell you from having visited countries that may not even have some sharia but that are there is a strong uh, muslim presence like a vast majority people walk around at 2 a.m. i was in the uae 2 a.m. people walk around i was in saudi and pakistan children families no fear man uh, there's places in america it gets dark you can't be out you right. get worried Right? Same in Europe. Yeah. yeah. That was my experience as well in Malaysia. It was yeah. It's beautiful. So family oriented. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, so I exactly. haven't seen that anywhere else. Yeah. Right? I mean, you go to places and you you have a son. I mean, think about it. Your son's going to be walking down streets in France, you see fully naked women, you see exactly. uh, in Germany you have daytime porn being shown. Oh, I yeah. don't want your son being raised in a society like that, right? Yeah, in terrible. the Sharia, look, you have you have that peace of mind. Yeah, now I found it beautiful. I think that sexual imagery or whatever has nothing to do on the outside. Bikinis and bras, advertisements yeah. everywhere. It's absolutely repulsive. Yeah. Can't go to a park without worrying that something will happen. It's terrible. Right. That's why I left Europe for now. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. That's basically it. We went through all of the questions, man. We have been at it for a long, long time and you answered everything. All right. So I got a question for you. Yes. Arabic first or English first? Brother, I'm going to tell you one thing. As much as I appreciate it and it would be a great honor to do it with you. Yeah. I I have a thing that I wouldn't like to do it online. You know, okay. for me personally, for me personally, right now I'm in Thailand. Mashallah. Next week, next week I want to visit some masjids here myself. 
Excellent. want to see it in real life because up until now everything has been happening online my journey has no been problem. by myself and that's why i want to see it in real life by myself and then make the decision right. so let's make a deal then all right uh visit mosques check out again you might find muslims that are not knowledgeable or doing something wrong don't let that distract you but sure. visit the community check it out uh thailand has a beautiful muslim community i've been there um but when you're ready call me we'll do it on the phone no online we'll do fair it enough. with me fair enough fair enough brother really i thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your questions it. and i think this is not only useful for myself but for the audience as well because you answered all of those islamophobic comments confusions christian questions and whatnot i believe that this will be of great benefit to everybody mm -hmm. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate your questions, your straight upness. And I pray that Allah guides me and you and puts us on the truth. And I have a very good feeling that very soon uh, you will be accepting what I think you already have in your heart. The belief that there is one creator, the belief that the Prophet Muhammad is the Prophet of, of Allah. Uh, there is a video I have about the splitting of the moon. You should check it out if you haven't seen it already. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, you know, I give the evidences and inshallah, when you're ready for your Islam after that, give me a call. Uh, I'll, I'll email you my phone, my personal phone number. And inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do your shahada. Inshallah. Don't protect, procrastinate too much. Remember, devil is going to make you want to just put things off. But at the same time, I want you to be comfortable with it. 100%. 100%. Amin, thank you so All much right. again, bro. Appreciate thank it. Thank you for taking time. Thank you. Have a great night. Yeah, we talk so. Ah, uh, it's still better. Yeah. Yeah. كل السرائر بادية